a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Kroger Tender Ray Beef, no other beef so fresh, can be so tender, presents... Hearts in Harmony transcribed. K is for Kroger, C is for cut, B is for beef. KCB means Kroger cut beef, and Kroger cut beef means more meat for your money. Yes, friends, Kroger cut beef gives you more meat, less waste. And here's why. Before the meat is weighed and priced, the Kroger method of cutting beef removes excess bone, excess waste, and stringy ends. Remember, that's before the meat is weighed and priced. And it's the very top U.S. government grades of beef that's tender, juicy, rich red, and marbled with just the right amount of flavory fat. So you see, you get a better value in top-grade beef. Now, to give you an example, let's take a Kroger cut rib roast. Before the roast is weighed and priced, the Kroger method of cutting beef removes the short rib end, the waist, and trims the chine bone. You don't pay roast price for the short rib end and waist. And no matter whether you buy a Kroger cut steak or roast, you receive more meat, less waste. So don't forget, that's at your Kroger store. See for yourself by visiting your neighborhood Kroger store soon. Make it a rule to buy Kroger cut beef and get more meat for your money. And now, hearts in harmony. Two weeks ago, young Barry Carlton died of injuries received in an automobile accident as he and lovely Penny Gibbs were driving to Heatherton to be married. Penny, her face badly scarred, her sight seemingly failing, is unaware of Barry's death, and lately has insisted on seeing him. This afternoon, Nurse Angela Brill is in Penny's hospital room and says... You seem especially cheerful this afternoon, Miss Gibbs. Oh, I feel a lot stronger, Angela. Maybe that's the reason. No, you're getting well. And getting out of here, I hope. Well, not right away. When do you think? I don't know. Remember, I'm just a nurse. (laughs) No, but has has Dr. Weston said anything to you about my leaving? No, he hasn't. But I imagine he'll talk to you about it before long. You do feel stronger, don't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Like, in fact, I think I'm strong enough to walk down the hall to Barry's room. Oh, no, you're not that strong. And you're not getting out of here again. I'm not. Not without doctor's permission. And you're certainly not going to be allowed to walk down the hall. No, I could have made it to Barry's room if you and Dr. Evans hadn't stopped me. That's what you think. You still had a long way to go, and you were weak enough to faint. Admit it now. You almost did faint, didn't you? (laughs) Well, you won't tell on me, will you, Angela? You know I won't. Well, do you feel strong enough to have a nice big dinner? Oh, I haven't much of an appetite, but I'll try and eat. The more you eat, the stronger you'll be, and the sooner you'll get out of here. You know, I'll miss you when you leave, Miss Gibbs. You're the nicest patient I ever had. Is that what you tell them all? (laughs) Heavens no. I'm glad to be rid of most of them. Oh, I miss you too, Angela. No, but I still can't wait to get on my feet again and walk out of here. Before we let you on your feet, Miss Gibbs, we're going to have you sit up in a chair a few hours a day. In fact, Dr. Weston says you may sit in a chair for an hour this afternoon if you'd like to. Oh, I'd love to. Fine. I'll get a chair ready for you, and then I'll help you fix your hair so you look nice for your visitor. Oh, Angela, you've been holding out on me. It's Barry, isn't it? He's coming to see me. No, it's not Mr. Carlson. It's Mr. Keith. Oh. He phoned from Rossville earlier this afternoon and asked if you were allowed to have visitors, and I told him you were. No, I don't want to see him, Angela. You don't want to see him? Why not? Can't you see why not? I can't let Johnny look at this face of mine. Oh, Miss Gibbs, you shouldn't feel that way about it. How would you feel if your face looked like mine? Well, I wouldn't be happy about it, but I'd know that something could be done about the scars and that something was going to be done about them before long. And most of all, I'd know my friends wouldn't care how I looked. Not my real friends. As I understand it, Mr. Keith is definitely one of your real friends. Yes, Angela, he is. I couldn't ask for a better friend, but I can't let him see me this way. But he's coming all the way from Rossville, especially to... Angela, you shouldn't have let him come, not without speaking to me first. I did what Dr. Weston says is best for you, Miss Gibbs. He wants you to have company. 
As much of it as you can stand. I don't want company, just a few people. Angela, it isn't fair to let people see me looking as I do. You'll have to tell Johnny I don't want to see him. Tell him I'm sorry, but I can't. Please, Miss Gibbs, for your own sake. Don't feel that those scars on your face make any difference to your friends. They do make a difference. They'll make people feel sorry for me. And I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me. Young man, have you forgotten that this is a hospital? Uh oh. Uh, uh, sorry, nurse, I had forgotten. Uh, I'm Johnny Keith. Oh, yes. I'm Nurse Brill. You've come to see Miss Gibbs, haven't you? Uh huh. Uh, may I go right in? I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Keith, but she won't see you. Won't see me? Well, I should have told you earlier that you were coming down so I could have phoned you and saved you a trip. Well, that's all right, but why won't you see me? What's wrong? She's sensitive about her face, Mr. Keith, and the scars are rather bad. Well, that's silly. Well, she ought to know the scars on her face don't make any difference to me. I tried to tell her that, but it didn't do any good. I see. Well, did, did she uh, refuse? Absolutely. I mean, is there any chance of seeing her? I'm afraid not, Mr. Keith. Well, you won't sneak me in, though, won't you? I would if I could, but I can't. It's not ethical to go against a patient's wishes. At least not in a case like this. Uh, well, uh, well, look, is, is there any chance of talking to her? By phone, maybe? Ooh, why, yes, you may use one of the phones right here if you want. Oh, swell. I'll get her for you. Okay. She uh, shouldn't object to talking to me, should she? Oh, I shouldn't think so. Yes? A 303, please. Just a moment. Don't expect to talk her into seeing you, Mr. Keith. She's quite determined that you won't. Well, I'm going to try anyway. Hello? Uh, Miss Gibbs, this is Angela. Mm-hmm. Mr. Keith is here and wants to talk to you on the phone. Oh. All right. Just a minute. Oh, that patient in 307 wants me again. And for what? To fluff up her pillow. <laughs> here you are, Mr. Keith. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hello, Penny. Hello, Johnny. How are you? Well, I was all right until a minute ago, and I found out you won't see me. Well, uh, I'm sorry if you made a long trip for nothing, but I can't see you. Why, Penny? You should know why, Johnny. Because there are a few scars on your face? Mm-hmm. Penny, what kind of friend do you think I am if I'd let that make any difference? Oh, maybe it's just my pride, Johnny. I'm ashamed of the way I look. Ashamed? Well, what's there to be ashamed of? Oh, Johnny, I look so terrible. It'll be enough to make you ill just to look at me. Penny, Penny, listen now, to me. Now, look, right? don't try and argue with me, Johnny. I won't see you. Yes, you will, Penny. You will see me. No, I won't. Now, listen to me a minute. And stop saying no and just listen. Penny, I... I know all about the scars on your face. I know how bad they are and how you must feel about them. I know how any beautiful girl would feel about even the slightest injury to her face. But I also know that two good friends don't turn away from each other because one of them is suddenly not quite as pleasant to look at as she was. Not pleasant to look at is putting it the right way, Johnny. Penny, I, I didn't come here to look at you but to talk to you and be with you a little while. But you'll have to look at me. Of course I will. I want to. Scars are not your Penny Gibbs. Still the same Penny Gibbs you've always been. Oh, no, no, I'm not, Johnny. Penny, you are. But you won't be if you continue to cut yourself off from your friends because of your face. But Penny, believe me, the only way you'll be able to rid yourself of unhappiness over those scars is, is to let people see you and find out for yourself how thoroughly those scars are ignored. Penny, the people who love you won't even see them. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, I wish I could believe that. Well, you can't, Penny. You have to. And, and you also have to let me see you. You have to let everyone who cares about you see you. And you're going to see me now. No, Johnny, please. Please, Penny, for your own sake. Let me prove to you how little it matters what you look like. Now, I'll tell you what. You know me better than I know myself. If your face affects me, you'll be able to tell it by the look in mine. Now, how about it? Now, let, let's make a test, see? And if I'm right, you'll never worry about your face again. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, I'm afraid. Oh, now, where's the old Gibbs spunk, huh? Now, come on, invite me in. Oh, I, I'd, I'd certainly like to, Johnny. You'd like but... to, so you will, huh? I'll say yes. All right, 
Johnny. For a minute. Yes, well, I'll be ready. Because you had your way, aren't you? Uh, I'm happy because I'm seeing you. Well, uh, you're not going to be completely happy, Johnny. Because... No, you're not going to keep that pillow against your face. Well, we're both going to forget all about the fact that your face is scarred. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, here's some mail your mother asked me to bring down to you. Thanks. Well, they have you sitting up in a chair. How does it feel? It's nice being out of that bed. Once I'm out of here, I won't want to see a bed again for months. <laughs> what are you going to do, sleep standing up? Oh, I'm sure going to try. Um, oh, uh, want me to uh, open the mail for you? No, thanks. I'll read it later. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, get the phone, Johnny, will you? I, I, I don't feel like reading myself over to it. Why, sure thing, lady. Hello? Oh, Mr. Keith. This is Nurse Brill. I was wondering where you were. Oh, it's all right, Nurse. I, uh, I didn't do what you're thinking. I didn't sneak in. I talked her into letting me come up and see her. Oh, I'm awfully glad you did. Is she all right? Oh, yes, yes, fine. Well, don't stay too long. Oh, I won't. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, that was your nurse, Penny. She... Oh, Penny, what's wrong? I, um... I just glanced at this letter while you were on the phone. Johnny, mm -hmm. you remember when I went to Hollywood two years ago? Well, yes, yes, I certainly do. Well, um, this is a letter from a producer who's just reviewed some of my guests. He has a part for me if I'm interested. Oh. If I'm interested. <laughs> it's very funny, isn't it, Johnny? Look at me. A penny. Look at my face and they want me for a fight. Your face isn't bad, Penny, and it's going to be fixed. <laughs> Uh, gosh, I, I, I'm sorry about that oh, letter. I, I guess your mother didn't realize it. It's all right. There's no reason to be sorry about it. As a matter of fact, this is the first thing I've had to laugh about in weeks. It's um, something to laugh about, too, and it? The way things work out. Yeah. yeah I uh, guess it is. Yeah. I uh, guess it is. Oh, they wouldn't have me when I wanted a part. And now they want me when I can't take it. Well, I guess it's just one of those things. Penny is sitting up and getting stronger every day. Is she strong enough now to be told about Barry Carlton? What will happen when they do tell her? Be sure to listen to the next dramatic episode of Hearts in Harmony. KCB. KCB. KCB means Kroger Cut Beef, and Kroger Cut Beef means more meat for your money. Yes, Kroger Cut Beef gives you more meat, less waste. That's because before the meat is weighed and priced, the Kroger method of cutting beef removes excess bone, excess waste, and stringy ends. You get more meat, less waste in Kroger Cut Beef. And it's top U.S. government grades of beef, tender, juicy, rich red, and marbled with just the right amount of flavory fat. So visit your neighborhood Kroger store and buy your favorite cut of beef. If you can get a Kroger cut sirloin steak, you'll notice that before the steak is weighed and priced, the Kroger method of cutting beef removes the stringy end, the waste, and the excess bone. Remember, whether you buy a steak or roast, Kroger cut beef gives you more meat for your money. But remember, ladies, you can buy a Kroger cut steak or roast only at Kroger stores. Make up your mind right now to visit your neighborhood Kroger store without delay. Your Kroger meat man has just the cut of beef you want. It's delicious and juicy. It's top-grade beef that will thrill your family. Make it a rule to buy Kroger cut beef and get more meat, less waste, which means you get more meat for your money at your Kroger store. Listen again tomorrow, same time, same station, for another exciting transcribed chapter of Hearts in Harmony. This is Walter O'Keefe inviting you to listen in on the Nightline. Tonight, live the incredible life of ages yet to come in a time that might be a million years from now.
on X minus one. Now an incredible story of the world beyond. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Skulking Permit, by Robert Sheckley. But first, hear this. Pick up some Paps Blue Ribbon. Take it home, chill it, then put it to this test. Have a glass of Paps with your meals for the next several days. You'll find Paps Blue Ribbon makes most everything taste better. That it adds zest and sparkle to any meal. Try it. The bright, modern taste of Paps Blue Ribbon is good anytime and wonderful with meals. Pabst is the name. Made by Pabst Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now, X-1 and Skulking Permit by Robert Sheckley. August 16th, year 2204. Two... Central Colonial Administrative Authority, Alpha Centauri Sector. From Colonial Contact Inspector 37. Subject, Lost Colony on Planet New Delaware. First contact established in 200 years. And proceeding on overdrive for personal investigation. I thought I told oh, you take to take it easy, Mayor. I've put the sign up. No aliens allowed within city limits. Uh, what's an alien? Never mind. Look at the church. You painted it wrong. Now, look. Here, I painted that church with a nice bright red. Now, what's wrong with that? I looked it up. It's a little red schoolhouse, not church house. Churches are supposed to be white. Well, I got along fine enough in New Delaware for 200 years without either of yes, them. Yes, I know. I know. But we need them now, and we haven't got much time. Hey, uh, when do I get a police chief badge? I read that the police chief always gets a badge. Make yourself one. Now, go on. All right, then. Oh, oh, it sure is hot. I don't know why the inspector couldn't have come in the wintertime. Oh, Tom. Tom Fisher. Yeah? Uh, come here, Tom. I've got a job for you. Well, now, uh, look, Mayor. I'm on vacation. The fish won't be back in these waters. Uh, no vacation. Not now. The inspectors do any day. Tom, how would you like to be a criminal? Well, I don't know. What's a criminal? Well, come over to my house, and I'll explain. I've got to appoint a criminal. And it looks to me like you're it. New Delaware. New Delaware. Do you hear me, New Delaware? Come in immediately. Yes, yes, yes. We, we hear you. This is Colonial Inspector 37. You of New Delaware are still a colony of Earth and subject to our laws. Do you acknowledge that status? Oh, yes. Yes, we called a town meeting last night and we talked it all over. We're still loyal to Earth. Excellent. That saves us the trouble of sending an expeditionary force to reconquer you for Imperial Earth. Imperial? Well, that's funny. All the books talk about Earth as a united democracy. A uh, lot can change in 200 years. You realize, of course, there is room for only one intelligent species in the universe. Man. All others must be suppressed, wiped out. We can tolerate no aliens. I'm sure you understand, General. I'm not a general. I'm a mayor. You're in charge, aren't you? Uh, yes. And you're a general. Be sure you're running an Earth colony, General. With no radical departures from the norm, such as free will, free love, free elections, or anything else on the prescribed list. Get your colony in order, General. Yeah. You see how it is, Tom? 
Now, about your job, Tom. I'm appointing you town criminal. Well, I don't see why there has to be a criminal. All the books say so. The criminal is as important as the postman or the police chief. He works against society. If you don't have people working against society, how can you have people working for it? I don't want to do it. Oh, now be reasonable, Tom. When this inspector comes, how can I hold my head up and tell him we don't have any crime? Don't you see that? Right there, the whole thing falls through. He'll see that we're not truly Earth-like. We're faking it. We're aliens. And you heard what he said about being rough on aliens. Well, yeah, yeah. But why me? Now, I'm supposed to have vacation now, now that the fishing season's over. Never mind. You're our criminal. Here, here, I've got this paper all made out for you just to make it legal. Uh... Skulking permit. No, all men with these presents that Tom Fisher is a duly authorized thief and murderer. He is hereby required to skulk in dismal alleys, haunt places of low repute, and break the law. What's law? Well, I'll let you know as fast as I make them up. All earth colonies have law. But what do we do? Well, you steal and kill. Look, I'll give you a couple of books on it, Tom. Steal as much as you like. One murder should be enough. Don't overdo it. Well, that doesn't sound sensible. Tom. Well, you can work up to it. Why don't you start off easy like by haunting a place of low repute? You're listening to Skulking Permit, tonight's attraction on X minus one. Careful planning and sensible driving add up to an enjoyable vacation trip. Here are a few tips from the National Safety Council that should help make your trip a pleasure instead of a tense, nerve-wracking time. Before you leave, have the car given a thorough checkup to be sure it will always respond properly to your careful control. Check the emergency equipment you'll need, such as a first aid kit, keys, permits, identification, flashlight, tire-changing equipment, and your unexpired driver's license. Plan your trip for frequent rest stops with a good night's sleep each night. And then, on your trip, pay attention to the job at hand and don't daydream. Stop off the road to see the sights or read the map. Be prepared for winding and straight roads, level and hilly roads, and changing traffic patterns between urban and rural areas. Obey all speed limits, traffic signs and signals, and keep your distance behind the driver ahead. This vacation is what you've been waiting for all year. Enjoy it with sensible driving. Now, back to Skulking Permit on X-1. Miss Filling? Hey, how come you ain't out thieving now, Tom? Well, I'm planning. My permit says I have to haunt places of low repute, and that's why I'm here. Well, this ain't no place of low repute. Well, you serve the worst meals in town. I know. My wife can't cook, but there's a friendly atmosphere here. Folks like it. Uh, Tom, now, 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 just a minute there. Oh, hi, Billy. What do you have? I'm on official police business. Now... Uh, Tom, what are you doing with that beer? Drinking it. Uh, Tom, I think you were planning on stealing it. You're a suspicious character. I think I'd better lock you up for further questioning. No, 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 Billy, Billy, what are you doing? I'm doing my duty, Mayor. Tom here is looking mighty suspicious. The book says... I know what the book says. I gave you the book. You can't go arresting Tom, not yet. Huh? Acting suspiciously isn't a crime. All right. But I was just trying to do my job... I'll still get you, Tom. Remember, crime does not pay. Crime does not... Hey, that's a real slick way of putting it, isn't it? I thought it was kind of catchy. I read it in the book. Morning, Mar. How's the schoolhouse coming? Oh, hi, Tom. Fair. Would have come along better if I'd had my saw. Your saw? Yes, I left it leaning against my door last night. Wasn't there this morning, Tom. Oh, oh, yeah, your saw. Well, you know how it is, Marv. I had to practice some skulking last night. Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Say, Tom, do you suppose I could use the saw for a while, just for an hour or two? Well, I don't know. It's legally stolen, you know. Well, I'd give it back. I wouldn't keep anything that was legally stolen. Well, it's in the house with the rest of the loot. Okay, I'll go borrow it then. Uh, Tom, I've been looking for you. Oh, morning, Mayor. Did you steal my bronze plaque? Oh, I certainly did. Oh, well, I was just wondering. Well, you got your murder planned? Time is running short. Inspector may land any hour now, so let's get that killing over with. Oh, well, then uh, I guess I'll kill George Waterman. Why? Why? Why not? What's your motive? 
Well, I thought you just wanted a murder. Who said anything about a motive? We can't have a fake murder. On Earth, every murderer has a motive. Oh, well. Well, I don't like the way George walks. Never did, and he's noisy sometimes. No, that might be good enough for a crime of passion, but you're a legal criminal, Tom. You're you're ruthless and cold-blooded and cunning. You can't kill someone just because you don't like the way he walks. That's silly. But I'm supposed to make somebody cease to exist. I mean, like, take Marv Carpenter. Here he is today working on a schoolhouse. Big fella. Now, if I kill him, well, he wouldn't work anymore. Now, I've been trying to imagine it. Marv Carpenter lying on the ground with his eyes glaring open and his mouth twisted and never going to hold a piece of wood in his hands again or never sing a song or have a beer or anything. It just kind of makes me sick. I mean, I can go on with a thieving, but murder... Yes, yes, I know, but it's your job, Tom. It's for the good of the village. Murder? Oh, I'd better go have another beer. Hey, <laughs> hey, what's that? That must be the inspector ship landing. Come on, let's go see. Perimeter guard advance. Sidearms to be worn at all times. And guards at battle stations. <clears throat> Welcome to New Delaware. Thank you, General. I'm the inspector. This is Mr. Grant, my political advisor. Is this the capital of the colony? Well, I'm afraid there's only one village on the whole of New Delaware. Only one? Grant, I told you when we surveyed the planet we were wasting our time. Patience, patience. We're ready, General. Let's inspect your village. We've got it all. Jail, post office, church, little red schoolhouse. Oh, we're very normal. Very earthly. Grant, this place is worthless. No smelting, no heavy industry, no atomics, no taxation. Oh, no. oh they don't have anything. They'll be downgraded at the next colonial board. Why, this place is a, a utopia. It's subversive. We ought to blow it right out of the sky. Now, now, don't be despondent, Inspector. New Delaware is a very important commodity for us. What? You saw them, hulking peasants, nothing but farmers. Yes, strong, healthy farmers. Good cannon fodder. But, oh, oh. Let me take over. General. Yes, sir? How many able young men are there in the village between the ages of 15 and 60? Uh, why? You see, General, Imperial Earth is engaged in a war. The colonies in Ding Four are revolting against the authority of Mother Earth. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. We need good, healthy fighting men. Our reserves are depleted. We wish to give all loyal colonists a chance to fight for Mother Earth. We're sure you won't refuse. Most colonies welcome a little conscription. Cleanses the blood. Reduces crime. Crime? Oh, I thought that would come up. We, we've taken care of that. I appointed... You see, Grant? Sixty, seventy, perhaps a hundred recruits. Not such a waste of time coming here after all. Hey, wait a minute, man. Oh, hello, Tom. What? What are you, what are you doing? Well, you said there had to be a murder, so... No, I'm no, no, I... wait just a minute. I, I... Look, I didn't mean me. It can't be me. You haven't any motive. Well, uh... I've been pretty sore about you appointing me town criminal. Well, look, it was the mayor who appointed you, wasn't it? Well, sure. Well, then, look, I'm not the mayor anymore. I'm, I'm a general. Look, you see, stars, gold braid. Well, what's that got to do with it? Well, you missed the ceremony this afternoon, Tom. The inspector said I had to wear a general's uniform. It was, it was a very friendly ceremony. All the earthmen were, were winking at me and each other. Oh, know. congratulations. But you were the mayor when you appointed me criminal, so my motive still holds. Yes, but killing a general isn't murder. It's mutiny. Oh. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, Tom. It's just that I've read up on it and you haven't. Well, i better get back. The inspector wants a lot of the men he can draft. Are you sure this murder is necessary? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Just not me. No luck, huh, Tom? I just can't do it. Ed, I can't kill anybody in the village. I grew up with him. I've worked with him. I've drank root beer with him. I don't have any motive for killing any of them. Well, Tom, you have to commit a murder. You don't want to let the village down. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I got an idea. Ed, suppose I kill the inspector. What's your motive? Oh, it would be a very terrible crime. I'd be killing for glory, for fame, 
for notoriety, and it'll show Earth how earthy New Delaware really is. Well, they'll say crime is so bad here that, that, that a criminal actually killed their inspector on the very first day. Yeah. How are you going to do it? Well, one of those soldiers got drunk in a bottle of your Keebler juice, and I stole his gun. Well, I better get going. I'll wait for him on the path between the mayor's house and the ship. Yeah. Good luck, Tom. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Sloppy crew, all their feet. Still, it's a nice, nice work. With those landing parties dying like flies, we can use every new man we can get. Shh! Don't say that. What? Are you afraid the mayor will hear me? Don't be ridiculous. It's a completely passive population, sheep-like, obedient. But wait till those sergeants get hold of them at the base. They'll whip them into first-class fighting men in no time. Halt! Stand and deliver! What the... Come. Hands up, Inspector. I, I got you covered. Now, the rest of you, drop your guns and move out of the way. What? Now, see here. Now, go on. Now, drop those guns. What's the meaning of this? And who are you? Uh, Tom Fisher. I'm the town criminal. I'm going to kill the Inspector. Now, please move out of the way. Criminal? So that's what the mayor was prattling about. Now, I know we haven't had any murders in 200 years, but I'm changing that now. Move out of the way. Well, I suppose I'd better get out of the line of fire, eh? Now, wait a minute. Wait. Now, don't move. Now, I know just how to do it. I've been thinking about it. I'll push this button and you'll die. Now, you'll fall down on the path and your eyes will be open and your mouth twisted and no air going in and out of your lungs and no beat to your heart. And I... And I, I... I can't do it. Here, here's your gun. Take it. I don't want it. Quick, quick after him. Sergeant, have the entire ship's company turned out. General, I want all your people out looking for him. Shoot on sight. Kill him instantly. Oh, we couldn't do that. Although we appreciate the compliment. What that man's a... He's a criminal, yes. That's that's what I'm trying to explain. I, I appointed him. We had to have one. You what? You mean you had no criminals? Well, I... No. No, I'm afraid not. I... Oh, I'm terribly ashamed. You see, we knew how uncivilized we were, and that, that's why we did it. I, I'm dreadfully embarrassed that Tom couldn't handle the job. Why did you give the assignment to that particular man? Well, I figured if anyone could kill, Tom could. He, he's a fisherman, you know. It's, it's pretty gory work. And he wasn't able to kill the inspector? Well, we just haven't had to kill anything for 200 years except fish. The only animals on New Delaware are small grass eaters, and they're not good to eat, so we never kill any of them. And the rest of you would be equally unable to kill? We wouldn't even get as far as Tom did. I want that man found and... Forget about it, Inspector. What? We'd better get away from here. You want men in our army who can't kill? Think of it. The morale problem. The possibility of infection. One man in a key position endangering a key ship. Or maybe a whole fleet. Because he can't kill. It isn't worth the risk, Inspector. Yes, sir. I, I see what you mean. Order your troops to get back to the ship. We'll take off at once. Tom? Tom, you can come out now. Tom, they're gone. He's he's hiding around here somewhere, Mayor. Yeah. Tom? Oh, Tom. Here I am. I'm sorry I bungled it. I guess I won't be needing my skulking permit anymore. No, no, I guess not. Well, we did our best. I had the chance, and then I let you all down. Oh, Tom, it, it's not your fault. Now look how long it took Earth to get civilized. Thousands of years, and we were trying to do it in two weeks. Yeah. Well, we better get back to the village. Looks like rain. Yep. Soon I'll start fishing again. Say. What is it, Tom? I think I could have done it. If I'd only had the sense to think of the inspector as a fish. Well, it's too late now. I guess I'll let the village down. Fred Collins again. And I'll have a word for you on tonight's X-1 in a moment. This is Bob Haynes speaking to you from somewhere in the Caribbean. I am aboard a UDT personnel landing craft. That's the underwater demolitions team. 
We are right now on our way out to rendezvous with United States submarine Sea Lion. Monitor took you there. Some men go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Some people sit on top of flagpoles. But we have a man by the name of Rajah Phillips from India who is buried alive right in the center of a furniture store here in Owensboro, Kentucky. And Monitor took you there. Big events, little events, offbeat events, comedy, music, news, and sports. They're all part of the top variety of entertainment Monitor brings you all weekend long. This is Frank Blair inviting you to join us on Monitor every weekend and Friday nights, too, on most of these NBC stations. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Blaze of Glory by Robert Silverberg. Galaxy Magazine on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Skulking Permit, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Robert Sheckley and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Richard Hamilton, Wendell Holmes, Dean Almquist, Mandel Kramer, Ted Osborne, Santos Ortega, and Bob Hastings. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. There's excitement in the air at night, and Nightline brings it to you. Hear Nightline with Walter O'Keefe next on most of these NBC stations. This is Walter O'Keefe, inviting you to listen in on the Nightline. Tonight, live the incredible life of ages yet to come in a time that might be a million years from now on X-1. Now, an incredible story of the world beyond. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Early Model by Robert Sheckley. But first, hear this. When you swing and sway to a Latin beat, life is lovely, life is sweet. You make it Pabst, cause Pabst makes it perfect. Yes, Pabst makes it perfect. Just as we always have ever since 1844. So next time, you make it Pabst, because Pabst makes it perfect. America's Blue Ribbon Beer from the Pabst Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes, Pabst makes it perfect. Now, X minus one and the Robert Sheckley story, Early Model. Of course, Professor Sliggett claimed the trouble was that the Protec was an early model, but then he invented it. He sprung the thing on me just before I took off for my scouting contact mission to Tellsfor in the Betelgeuse sector. Here, Bentley, put this on. Well, what is it? A new model. It's called a Protec. What's it for? Now, you'll wear it on your mission. 
Now, look, Sligan, I already have to carry enough equipment to give varicose veins to an elephant. Linguacine, that's 22 pounds. I can't do without it or I can't translate native languages. Concentrated food, water, subspace radio, weapons, medical kit. Now, how much does this thing weigh? 72 pounds. Try it on. Look, I won't promise to It fits to take... right on your back. Here, I'll snap the harness. Hmm, it's fine. Uh, it digs into my back. There's a sharp thing back That's there. That's the sensory link. It has to be at that angle. But my back... We're working on the problem. Now, don't worry. What does it do? Protec is the perfect protection for initial planet contact. There are pseudo-protein computer banks and an Anderson Woodward force field projector. Wherever the Protec senses danger... Yeah, look, I'll show you. I take this slide rule and swing at you. Hey, where did everybody go? Who turned out the lights? Hey, Sligit, where am I? Sligit, get me out of here. Sligit! You... What happened? The Protec went on. Ooh. It encased you in the AW force field. I released by master control. You can turn it off with this button on your chest. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, but 73 pounds. Well, this is an early model. I've used every weight-saving device possible, but unfortunately, early models are always a little bulky. All right, all right. How do I take it off? I'm not going to tell you. Huh? We're not going to take chances of having valuable equipment discarded just because it might be a little uncomfortable. Bentley, you're going to an alien planet. It's necessary that you be protected at all times. Look, I've got enough sense to figure out when to wear this thing. Yeah. Suppose you find the natives seemingly friendly. You'd want to take off this heavy, uncomfortable protest. But suppose you misjudge their attitude. Sligert, I can take care of myself. That's what Atwood said before he left for a Topus Three. We never heard from him. Bentley, can you turn a knife thrust from the rear? Have you got eyes in the back of your head? Protect has. We're not going to risk eight million dollars worth of equipment just because you might be uncomfortable. Suppose it blows a fuse or, or a pops a wire. We've got triple everything with a power supply good for a century. Bentley, after this field test, the Protec will be standard equipment for all explorers. Well, all right. I'll try to get used to it. But it feels like I'm carrying a 72-pound monkey on my back. <laughs> carried it for six weeks on the way to Tell's Four. And the added weight loused up my coordination and landing, so I burned out about seven acres with backlash from the braking tube. The radio receiver buried in my ear itched, and my back was rubbed raw from the carrying straps. I piled on my linguacine and the other equipment and staggered out. My instructions were to fraternize with the aborigines and establish a trade pact, if possible. I found two of them standing outside the tail fins when the hull had cooled enough to get out. They were bipeds, orange-skinned with thick, short tails, and they were armed with stone axes and clubs. I stepped out of the lock, and they started talking fast. I realized I hadn't turned on my linguacine, so I tuned it in and threw the switch. I dare say it's a manifestation of some supernatural quality, eh, Wassel, old chap? Without a doubt, old man. You know how the linguacine works, instantaneous semantic translation. Well, mine was made by the Gorley Laboratories just outside London, and naturally they had the word tapes recorded by BBC announcers. It takes a little getting used to when you hear some walking vegetable from the Canopus system talking like the home service. Well, the Tellians were pretty excited by my arrival. How strange. Unbelievable. Most improper, you know. I suppose it can talk. I... I come as a friend. A friend. Well, it does talk. Dreadful accent. But what can you expect, eh? Foreigners, you know. You know, old boy? I definitely sense an evil. Oh, now, come. We're both ghost doctors. Surely if there was an evil, we'd both sense it. Well, let's ask, shall we? Let's. I say, are you evil? Me? Why, yes. You see, we're the village ghost doctors. It's our job to ferret out evil, so to speak. It's our cup of fugal, so to speak. Are you evil? Oh, no. No. He says he's not evil. Well, how do you know? Well, he doesn't, who does? My dear fellow, appearances aren't everything. Surely you recall the legend of Hatape, the gods tempted the chief... Please, by... my dear chap, I'm as well aware of religious precedent as you are. The two of them stood there, lashing their orange tails, accusing each other of heresy. The linguacine finally couldn't handle the theological discussion and cut out before overload blew a circuit. Eventually, they must have decided something because the short one carrying the stone axe turned to me. 
Stranger, we've decided not to kill you. Not yet, anyway. We'll go to the village and purify ourselves, then we'll initiate you into the club. The club? The Society of Ghost Doctors. You see, no evil thing can become a ghost doctor. It just isn't done, you know. Oh, we'll find out the truth that way. <laughs> Clever. Eh? I'm deeply grateful. But if you're evil, we'll destroy you. Have to. Our job, you know. You are listening to Early Model, the night's attraction on X-1. For the big things in your life, be ready with United States Savings Bond. That's the new savings bond with the higher interest rate. The improved Series E savings bonds that now mature faster to pay you back extra dollars faster. Yes, when you think of savings, think of savings bonds. They offer you the safe, easy way to save regularly. Safe because each bond is backed by the United States government itself. Easy because you can buy bonds either where you bank or through the payroll savings plan where you work. And you get back $4 at maturity for every three invested, so you earn extra dollars. But the big news is that the maturity period is shortened to only eight years and 11 months. So join the bond wagon. Start a family savings program. Invest in improved Series E bonds today and hold the bonds you already own. Now, back to X-1 and tonight's story, Early Model. Sliggard, calling Professor Sliggard at home base. Come in. Go ahead, Bentley. Report. I'm in the village now. They're about to initiate me as some kind of priest. All I have to do is pass some kind of test. And, uh, by the way, if I don't pass, they're going to kill me. <laughs> ah, that's good. What's funny? They can't hurt a hair on your head, not with Protec on the job. They seem awfully confident that they can. Primitive cultures always overestimate the power of their weapons. Don't worry. Just let Protec take care of you. Go ahead, old boy. It's purified ceremonial food. But I can't. Why not? We purified with seven sprinklings of strychnine, according to ritual. It's a, a taboo. I'm only allowed to eat my own supplies. A, a tribal taboo, you know. How primitive. Positively pagan. Well, well shall we get on with it? Uh, we'll dispense with the written exam and get right down to the oral. Tell me, what do you think of evil? Well, well it isn't good. Ah. Well put. Yeah. Well, in that case, you have no objection to receiving the sacred and very holy spear that uh, Cran Clue brought down from the abode of the small gods, the brandishing of which brings good on a man? Oh, I would be honored to receive it. Very well, then. The ceremony can commence. Oh, stranger from the skies, accept from us the spear of sanctity. Evil cannot abide the presence of this spear. Take, then, our blessings with it. Here, here, oh stranger, take the spear! Confounded Protec, where's that release button? Sliggard, Sliggard, come in! Oh, he's probably out to lunch. Gotta get that force field off. Uh, listen, listen, I, I, I'm terribly sorry, but I... purification, Dodge! We are in the presence of evil spirits! Oh, no, 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 I can explain. You cannot accept the sacred spear. Well, you see... I've got this protective device. It's sort of like a shield, you know? It doesn't like spears. It doesn't trust them. You couldn't give me a, a sacred gourd? No. Who ever heard of a sacred gourd? Poppycock! Look, you'll just have to take my word for it. I'm not evil. Really. Scout's honor. Our course is clear. Transparent. We won't kill you at once. We'll pray for you through the night. And perhaps in the morning, things will turn out better. If not, sorry, old boy, but you understand our position. We'll just have to kill you. Can't be helped. Regulations, you know. Yes, yes, Bentley, I understand. Well, primitive people are notoriously treacherous. 
They might have stabbed you with the spear. Look, Sliggett, I'm positive there was no such intent. After all, you have to start trusting people sometime. Not with a billion dollars worth of equipment in your charge. Don't you understand? The Protech wouldn't let me accept their sacred spear. That means I might be evil. Now, what if I can't pass the initiation test tomorrow? Look, tell me how to take it off. Oh, no. We want you back alive. No way they can hurt you through the protect field. Now, try to have a little faith. The campfires burned all night, and I could hear the chants of the ghost doctors. At least three or four times during that night, the protect force field howled on and off, but I was too tired to care. In the morning, the two Tellians came to see me and stood switching their fat orange tails politely while the linguacine translated for me. There were great sounds from your hut last night, sounds of torment, as if you were wrestling with a devil, so to speak. I'm a restless sleeper. Yes. Yes, of course. Quite. By the way, Elting, did you pray for purification last night? Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I did. And was your prayer granted? Yes. Oh, yes, sure, certainly. Not a, not a bit of evil around me. Well, if you can't be initiated, we'll have to destroy you. We made that clear, didn't we? Oh, yes. Quite clear. The initiation ritual took the whole day. It was sort of a cross between a Shriners convention and a performance of Das Rheingold at the Met. Luckily, no one tried to hand me a ceremonial spear or point a club in my direction, so the Protech kept its grimy force field to itself. Finally, around supper time, the Tellians pounded the last tail on the ground, and everyone stopped and paid close attention. Oh, brothers, this alien has come across the vast emptiness to be our brother. With this initiation, we purge him of evil and make him one of us. Brother, now you are a ghost doctor with all the privileges and purposes pertaining thereto. And in friendship, I extend to you the claw of friendship. Well, thanks. We have only to shake claws, and the ceremony is concluded. All right, brother. Give me some skin. Slip me seven. No, no, listen, turn it off. He just wants to shake hands. You're spoiling everything. Off, off. Now, where's that button? Off. <laughs> evil. 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 Well, there it is, you know. We hoped we could muddle through, but you can't win them all, you know. There's only one thing left. Kill the devil. About 30 of the Tellians heaped stone spears at me, and naturally I disappeared inside the Anderson Woodward force field, and the spears rattled off the whining coruscating power sphere. I tried to walk back to the ship, but the protect went on about every half step, and at that rate it would take me about a month to cover the ground. I figured I'd wait him out. And then I noticed that the air inside the field began to go stale. I came out of the field. The Tellians were sitting around. Rennick picked up a spear. Evil. Wait, wait. Hold off. Uh, uh, fins. Fair play. Fair play? Oh, I yes. say, Rennick, he's due a three-minute sanctuary under the sacred law of his sipple. You really think so? He invoked fair play. True. True. All right, monster. You have three minutes. Thanks. Hello. Hello, Sliggert. Come in, Sliggert. Ah, there you are, Bentley. Listen, you've got to get me out of this. They're trapping me in the protect. You mean the protect is saving you from harm? No, no. They keep activating it. They'll starve me out. Now, don't get in the protect field till they see they can't harm you. You confounded idiot. There's no air in there. The force field cuts it off. I'll choke. Oh, oh dear. That's true, isn't it? Ah, don't worry. We'll correct that in future marvels. Oh, thanks a lot. But what am I going to do right now? How do I get this thing off? Well, now I am sorry. To tell the truth, I designed the harness so that you couldn't get out under any circumstances. Oh, you lousy. Please, please. Let's keep our heads. If you can hold out for a couple of months, we might be able I to... I can't. The air, the water... I hate to mention it, but they seem to be building fires around me. I'm sorry. Your three minutes are up. Yeah. We are going to destroy you with fire. Yeah, it's traditional that way. Uh, my dear chap, would you like to kindle the first blaze? Oh, after you, old fellow. Remember, I burned the last evil monster. True, true. Oh, uh, monster. Yes? Do you have a light? I knew I was cooked one way or the other. They started to light fires around me in a circle, and the Protech snapped on. I had to get out. 
Of course, when I did, the Tellians would cheerfully spear me to death. But at least I had a chance of running. The field snapped on again. I grabbed my knife from the tool chest and hacked at the thick, dural plastic webbing of the harness. I came out of the field long enough to hear Sligert shouting in my ear. What are you doing? Cutting my way out of this fire trap. You don't dare destroy government equipment. This will go down on your 201 file. Look, I'm trapped inside the field as long as they feed the fire. And considering how they feel about devils, they'll probably keep it up a couple of hundred years. Uh Oh, they're pushing the fire closer. Goodbye. I tore at the straps with my wire cutters and knife. I could only work when the field was off. The protect protected itself. Finally, I ripped the harness off just as the field went on, and I was thrown 20 feet into the fire. But I landed on my feet and was off and running. It took the Tellians just 100 yards to catch up and gently lay a stone club along the side of my head. Oh, Oh, well, let's get it over with. You're going to kill me. Let's not make a production out of it. Oh, but my dear fellow, we don't want to kill you. Dear me, no. We knew you were a good man. It was the devil we wanted. I don't mean to be tactless, but you do know you had a devil riding on your back. We tried to purify him, but he was too strong. (laughs) The fire took the starch out of him, though. The devil? Devil on my back? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess so, yes. You know, our village is very proud to have such a powerful devil chained up inside a fire ring. Uh, Tell me, my dear chap, you haven't by any chance any more devils like that in your homeland? No, that's the only one. Pity. We'd really be tickled orange if we could have a few more uh, to worship, you know. You mean trade for them? Why, yes. I'm sure every village would want one. Well, I think that can be arranged. And you haven't seen anything. We'll sell you devils that really are devils, after all... This one is just an early model. Fred Collins again. And I'll be back to tell you a word about tonight's X-1 in a moment. Bob! Bob Barker! Yes, Ralph? Ah, Bob. I uh, just want to say that I heard you emceeing the Truth or Consequences program on NBC Radio, and I thought you were great, boy. Well, that's real, quite a real great. I mean it. <laughs> Coming from none other than Ralph Edwards, the creator of and original Truth or Consequences MC. You really liked the show, Ralph? Oh, I'll say I did. It was wonderful hearing it on radio again. It sounded better than ever. Well, no one should know better than you, Ralph. But really, we just can't miss. Our contestants are wonderful. Yes, the I know. are out of this world. Mm-hmm. Surprise family reunions, the gigantic whisper contest. Yes. A dream world of jackpot prizes, especially for NBC radio listeners. Really? And not just once a week, Ralph, but every weekday morning. No That's kidding. right. Monday through Friday. Can you beat it? I'm going to right now, Bob. So long, folks. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Make Me an Offer by Con Blomberg. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Early Model, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Robert Sheckley and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Bob Hastings, Joseph Bell... Anthony Campbell Cooper, and Alastair Duncan. This is Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. There's excitement in the air at night, and Nightline brings it to you. Here in Nightline with Walter O'Keefe. Next on most of these NBC stations. Three hundred miles from the magic island of Euclidia. Three hundred miles between the Gregory Party and the weird colony of scientists who have held them captive for so long. With Joan Gregory at the controls of the stolen Euclidean submarine, putting another forty miles behind them every hour, it looks as if Jerry and Joan, Mrs. Gregory, and Tex Bradford have really escaped from the island. 
They are not to be allowed to get away without some opposition, however, as the Euclidians have been sending out directional radio beams in an attempt to locate the missing submarine. All is quiet inside the sub now, and only Jerry and Joan are to be seen in the central control section. Are you sure we won't disturb your mother and Tex if we talk up here? There is no danger of that, Jerry. But you can hear our voices all over this thing. Yes, if I had not closed the stern section off. Closed it off? Well, I can still see Tex and Mrs. Gregory asleep back there on the bunk. To be sure you can. There is no necessity of losing visibility merely to restrict sound. Yeah, I know. Everything's so easy for you to do. That's another one of those soundproof doors, I suppose. To be sure. One of the transparent steel doors. Mother and the captain may rest there in perfect comfort and silence while we continue our discussion. What discussion? We were speaking of plans for our amusement in Los Angeles. Oh, it'll be easy enough to find plane to amuse you with when we get there. But I'd like to know a little more about our plans for the rest of this ocean. The rest of this ocean, as you refer to the balance of our cruise, should prove comparatively uneventful. Yeah, I can see that. Nothing's liable to happen to us except old G-47 and his Euclidians. And when they happen to you, it's not so funny. If there is any method by which the Euclidean scientists are able to interfere with our journey, that method is not apparent to me at this time. But this was too easy. You can't steal a submarine and get away with it anywhere in the world, least of all from these guys on that island. The success of our plan depends on the element of surprise. I guess they were surprised, all right. Indubitably. Huh? Indubitably. Oh, okay. But I'll bet they were surprised, too. You may continue to misunderstand me, but we are obviously safe from Euclidean pursuit. I'm not so sure. How far are we from the Magic Island? 306 miles. And you think we're safe from those scientists? That is my belief. What about their 500-mile-an-hour airplanes and their 1,000-mile-an-hour rocket ships? We are in eight fathoms of water, Jerry. Can't they locate, locate us easy enough with their directional radio stuff? Not from Euclidia. Not so long as we do not attempt to use the radio set. Well, we won't do that. We got one message from Johnson, and we know he's waiting for us in Los Angeles. That's enough for us. It will be quite simple for a Euclidean plane to locate us in the water at this depth. What did I just get through telling you? But they have no weapon which will prove effective. Couldn't a Euclidean plane attack one of our subs in this much water? To be sure. But these underwater crafts are insulated against all Euclidean weapons, to my knowledge. Yeah, that's right. They would be, or your boats would be shooting up each other practicing. Exactly. Well, I'll bet they could cause us plenty of trouble, though. That they could easily do. And they could compel us to submerge to such a depth that our progress would be restricted to the vanishing point. Well, what more do you want? What more do I want? I mean, what more harm do they have to do to us? If they can dive this thing down to the ocean floor and make us stay there until our provisions and fuel are gone, all they've got to do is wait until we have to come up to the surface for help and grab us. That would be sound reasoning if Euclidean submarines were not superior to your worldly ones. I know that you've got the best boats in the world. But no matter how much you know about science, you've got to eat and sleep just the same as anybody else. And we can't live on the water forever. Our oxygen supply is continuously refreshed from the water. I'm talking about food. We're going to have to keep eating. We have sufficient compressed food to last a month with care. And during that time, we could reach Los Angeles if we were compelled to progress at an almost negligible rate along the ocean floor. And they can't reach us with anything if we go deep enough? No one can reach us at our maximum depth. And just how deep can we go until they keep this thing moving along a little bit? We may operate at a speed of four knots at a depth of one and one-half nautical miles, 9,120 feet. Golly, whiskers. Won't the sides of the sub cave in from the water pressure when we get down that deep? There is no natural water pressure on this globe sufficient to injure this submarine. Well, if you say so, I'll have to believe it. And it looks like we're going to get home all right. I'm sure of that, Jerry. We will arrive safely in California with the captain's formula remaining a secret from the Euclidians. And what Tex will do to them with that formula will be plenty. Do you know how he proposes to use it? Well, I'm not any too sure, but I think... One moment, Jerry. I must refuel. Oh, give the sub another those little pills, huh? Yes. It will take but a few seconds to inject the fuel pellet and clear the combustion tank. You may continue your remarks, Jerry. Huh? Jerry, you may continue. Uh, continue? What? The discussion of the captain's formula and its use. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. 
Oh, I was watching that refueling thing, and I guess I forgot what we were talking about. You were going to attempt to explain how the formula for the universal solvent may be used in capturing the island of Euclidia. No, I wasn't. But you said... I said I wasn't any too sure how Tex intended to use it, and I'm not. Maybe he can explain it to you. I will ask him. Well, don't wake him up to do that. That will not be necessary. The captain is awake. Huh? Oh, yeah. It looks like your mother's awake, too. Those thin metal sleeping compartments are perhaps not too comfortable for them. I'll take a chance on going to sleep on one of them. You will be given the opportunity the moment Mother and the Captain come forward to relieve us. You mean you're going to let Tex and Mrs. Gregory run this thing while you and I sleep? Certainly. But, oh, do they know how? I can give them all the necessary instructions in ten seconds. Well, I guess I can spare that much time. But I can sure use a little sleep before long. Mother and the Captain are now approaching I'll bet Tex bumps his head in that transparent steel door. I know it. I will remove the transparent section panel. Okay, Tex. You can come up here now. What was that I bumped my head on? A transparent steel panel. You will find no further obstructions to your passage. It's a strange sensation to watch a man stop by a steel wall that you can't even see. Yeah, stranger than that when you're the fellow who gets stumped. Joan put that section across the stern sleeping quarters so our talking wouldn't wake you up. And we did sleep. At least I did. Yeah, I did too, but I sort of feel a little like I've been sleeping on a rock pile. Those flexible steel mattresses are a little strange to us. Those will be found on all Euclidean craft. So there won't be anything to burn if a fire tries to start, Precisely. huh? Precisely. Well, kids, I feel a little guilty about letting you two stand watch while Pat and I slept, but if you think you can trust us to run this thing, we'll take it over. Will that be all right, Joan? Captain Bradford can do everything I could possibly do. Joan can set all the automatic controls for you, and this stuff navigates itself. Would it make any difference if you open those visibility slides for us, Joan? None, whatever. No, I think I'd like to have them open. Even if we can't do anything about it, I'd like to see where we're going. It's nice and quiet riding along with them clothes, though. Yeah, I know, Jerry, but I know how Mrs. Gregory feels, too. And I'm inclined to agree with her. A little good old sound will be a tonic for both of us. Yeah, it is a little too quiet for me here, but Joan likes it this way. I will open the slide for you, Captain. I have just refueled, and you may repeat every 40 knots. I understand, Joan. Tex and I will stand a four-hour watch. We'll stand it as long as it takes you two to get some rest. You must be all in. Oh, I'm not tired, but I guess I could sleep a little. We will rest four hours. At that time, we may expect the Euclidean location beam again. Could we try the radio? No, it is too dangerous. But you said the Euclideans had nothing they could harm us with in the sub. That is true. However, if they learn of our exact location, it will be a simple matter for them to follow our progress to Los Angeles. And there are many ways in which they might plan a most unpleasant reception for us. Yes, you're right, Joan. I think our best chance is to get into port without being located, if that's possible. Well, come on, Joan. Let's go back and collect some shut-eye. Collect what? We'll take 40 winks. You know, hit the hay. Pile in the feathers. Go on the downy. Don't you understand any of those? I do not. Well, I mean, let's go back and lie down and sleep. Then you should say what you mean. You are now the one who is using large words where small ones would serve much better. Well, never mind about that. I'll argue with you after I get some sleep. Well, how do you shut this door? I will close the door. Yeah, those kids sure spend a lot of their time quarreling. Yes, but it seems to be excellent for their morale. They also spend a lot of time getting things done. They sure do. The nerve of Joan stealing this submarine. Mm, I'm very proud of her, Tex. You should be. If Joan learns our ways... She will be the most accomplished girl of her age in the country. Do you think we'll reach home in safety? We've got a long way to go. If Joan and Jerry can keep their heads up, we should be able to. Joan forgot to open that slide for us. I'd like to see out into the water, Tex, and see where we're going. Oh, I know how to do that. I watched Joan close the slide. It's this one. Oh, I like that ever so much better. I'm not sure I do. We're a long way down the water, Pat. But this submarine is so safe. And what a wonderful machine it is. Think of being able to look through a wall of transparent steel. Yes, and a wall that will stand water pressure at a depth of a mile and a half. I'd say we were pretty safe, Pat. Well, at least we're not under G-47's eyes, and he can't hear every word we say. We can hear you, though. What, Tex? Was that Jerry? Yes, but that stern section is soundproof. Nevertheless, we can hear all you say. How are they doing that? Sounds like a speaker of some kind. It's work, Tex. This is the communication system. We're hearing you through the little microphone right in front of you. Will you two stop playing and get some rest? Your four hours will pass soon enough. You are correct, Mother. We will cut off the voice channel. Those kids sure managed to keep their spirits up. They're a good deal younger than we are, Tex. 
Well, I'm sure Jerry's a lot younger than I am, but uh, you and Joan could pass for sisters. Now, Tex, I have a fair idea of my appearance, and I know it isn't particularly flattering. Your appearance is always exactly to my liking. Oh, well, you're a sweet person, Tex. You spent many a year helping me search for Joan. Mm, it's been more than worth it. Now we've found her. Yes. She's mine at last. After 14 years, I'm actually taking her home, Tex. Home. Oh, it will be a home now. For the first time in those 14 long years. Wait a minute, Pat. I heard something. Something strange. Yes. And I thought I felt the submarine quiver. You must have passed over a high reef. No. The water's clear all around us. There isn't an obstruction in sight in any direction. Well, I know something happened. Well, Tex, it's getting nearer. And it didn't sound good to me. Those were Euclidean magnetic bombs. Dive at once. Well, how do I do it? Oh, Tex. Quiet, Mother. That large lever between your knees, Captain. Pull it to you. Pull it quickly. We are being attacked from the air. Pull that lever. The magic island of Euclidia is a weird place to discover. A difficult place to escape from, and now it seems that it's going to prove an even harder job to stay away from it. Jerry and Joan, Mrs. Gregory, and Captain Bradford stole one of the Euclidean submarines, and with Joan at the control, they raced away from the island in safety. Now they are nearly 400 miles from Euclidia, and that should be a safe enough distance from anywhere. But things move fast with G-47 and his scientists. We find Captain Bradford at the controls in the central section of the submarine with Mrs. Gregory at his side. A strange sound had just reached their ears. The submarine hesitates, then is tossed about as if a heavy shell had exploded near it. And from the stern section, Joan screams at the captain to dive. The submarine is being attacked. We're diving, Tex. You must have moved the right lever. Looks like it, but we don't seem to be going down very fast. Jerry and Joan are rushing up here from the stern, and Joan will know what to do. I pulled this thing just as she told me. You're doing everything that can be done, Captain Bradford. But we're not diving very fast. You said this thing could dive like a fish. Under proper conditions, these submarines will dive rapidly. Well, what's the matter, Joan? What's happening? Euclidean magnetic bombs. Magnetic bombs? What are they? I will explain later. We must reach a greater depth at once. I did everything you told me to, Joan, but we're sure going down mighty slowly. Our danger is also increasing. Those magnetic bombs are finding our range. Let me have the controls, Captain. Go to it, Joan. Can I help? Yes, remain out of my way. Okay. I will use the emergency jet. All of you must hold firmly to the arms of your steel chairs. The vibration may be sufficient to break the ship in half, but we must try it. Hold your station. Now we're really diving. Our speed must be terrific. It's almost like a power dive in a plane. I think we will gain our freedom now. This rate of descent will rapidly put us beyond reach of the magnetic bombs. I could get seasick awfully easy. Oh, I don't blame you, Jerry. I guess we can stand it if Joan can. We're nearly free from the effect of the bombs. In a few seconds, I will be able to reduce the speed. Are we all right now? I think there is no further danger from those magnetic depth charges. However, I will continue our descent more gradually until we reach a depth of 3,000 feet. We've got to go down over half a mile to be sure of losing those attackers? Yes, Captain. They were not in a submarine, were they? No, Mother. A Euclidean plane flying over us. And they dropped those bombs from a plane? Precisely. But the explosions didn't do us any damage. Except to rock the boat around a little, why go so deep? Those are magnetic bombs, and their action is purely magnetic. Had we remained longer at that depth, the pull of those release charges would have paralyzed this submarine completely. And naturally, that would have placed us at the absolute mercy of anyone who wanted to reach us. But, Joan, I don't understand that at all. How could a bomb exploding in the water generate enough magnetic force to harm a hundred-foot submarine? Those bombs contain a charge of chemical which, when mixed with salt water, produces a magnetic field in the water, a field with a large radius. And the power is sufficient to render every instrument, every control on this boat useless for a considerable period of time. Boy! That's a new one. It certainly is, Jerry. I can imagine how it might work. But one thing that isn't clear to me, Joan. Any solution released in a body of water as large as the ocean will become diluted to the point of uselessness almost at once. That is true, Captain. But paralyzed instruments, magnetized controls, and helpless submarines do not return to normal in an instant. 
I can't think of a more terrible threat, a worse danger than a submarine without instruments, power, or control. Well, if they were going to capture us, well, they'd have to hang around the air dropping bombs until we got ready to surrender. Well, that wouldn't give these Euclidians much trouble, would it, Joan? Not when you remember that a Euclidean plane could easily afford to cruise 100 hours over our position and still have sufficient fuel to return to Euclidia from our present position. I'm sure it wouldn't take 100 hours or half that long for me to be ready to give up. Drifting along in eight fathoms of water, helpless. Oh, no, Joan. I'd be ready to meet their terms long before the hundred hours was up. Yeah. That wouldn't be so good. Now, if that magnetism really got hold of us, we couldn't do anything, huh, Joan? Not a thing. The oxygen jets would be paralyzed and our air supply soon exhausted. The emergency escape locks would not operate. And we could not leave the ship. There would be only one thing to do. Yes, I know what that would be. Surrender. I don't see how we could even do that. We can't leave the sub or get a message out of here. How could we let our captain know we were ready to give up? How could we get to the surface to surrender? There is one thing on board not affected by magnetism. Our compressed air supply. Our only resort would be to fill the space between the inner and outer shells of the submarine with compressed air. And float to the surface as the water was driven out of the stabilizing channel. Even then we could not leave of our own will. It would be necessary for our captors to release us from without. And now, Joan, will we be able to proceed toward home at a lower level? To be sure, Mother, though our progress will be comparatively slow. Just how slow do you call comparatively? At a depth of 3,000 feet, the highest speed we may maintain consistently will be 11 knots. 11 knots? At a depth of over half a mile? I do not hope to exceed that. I shouldn't think you would. Golly, whiskers, 11 knots under a half a mile of water... Well, our submarines think they're doing all right if they make 11 knots any time. I am confident we may plan on continuing at that speed. That's very wonderful, Joan, and certainly surpasses anything we'd ever dreamed of at home. But at that speed, will we be able to reach Los Angeles on our present supply of food and fuel? I was wondering about that. We will have more than enough fuel and food enough for a much longer time. Well, say, now that we're talking about food, it looks like we might get a chance to eat a little without being shot at. How about having our dinner? Are you hungry, Jerry? Well, if I'm not, I'm sure mixed up in my feelings. We should not need more food at this time. Well, what's the matter? You're afraid these Euclidean pills will make us too fat? We had sufficient food for a definite number of hours. It is not time for the next meal. Never mind what the clock says. My stomach is a lot more apt to be right about my being hungry. Yes, I'm going to add my voice to yours, Jerry. I could stand something to eat. Well, if everyone else feels that way, I'll admit a huge appetite. Looks like you'll just have to sit around and watch the rest of us eat, Joan. I shall do nothing of the sort. You will open a vial labeled S4, Jerry. S4? What's the S for? Oh, Jerry, what a horrible pun. Didn't you like it? It was pretty bad, son. A more completely descriptive adjective would be atrocious. Okay, if you don't like my puns, I'll eat all four of the pills and none of you will get any fried chicken. Do you remember where you got the last meal, Jerry? Oh, yeah, right out of here. It sounds funny when you call a little bottle of four pills a meal. They seem to satisfy us before, though, Jerry. Jerry knows the food is satisfactory. He is merely exercising his talent for discussion. <laughs> I believe you've got his number, Joan. Number? What is your number, Jerry? Oh, never mind. Well, here's a little bottle labeled as four. I'd like to ask what that label means, but uh, I don't want to run into any plans, as Jerry did. The letter S designates sunset, or time for the evening meal. And the figure four in Arabic numerals states the quantity. Four people may be served from that vial. S for sunset. What was the Z for on the bottle we had at lunch? Z for zenith, as Euclidians take their noon repast when the sun is at meridian height. Roughly 12 noon. And what will our breakfast be labeled? The morning meal is designated as D for daylight. And the number of people following. Our breakfast will therefore be... D4. Oh, huh. D4 for breakfast, Z4 for lunch, and S4 for dinner. <laughs> Does sound funny, Jerry, but I like what I had at lunch. Uh, suppose you pass the steak. Hmm. How will you have your steak, Mrs. Gregory? Mm, just medium, Jerry, not too well done. Okay, one medium steak. You get till number one. What was yours, Joan? Steak, chop, macaroni? I will have one of the pellets, Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall? Mm -hmm. You appear to be a gentleman of note, Jerry. I don't think she meant it that way. But here's your bacon and eggs, Captain. I think I'll have some pancakes and honey for mine. I shall now restrict the angle of our dive to five degrees. That will enable us to reach 3,000 feet in a short time and will also allow me adequate protection from the automatic pilot. 
I will soundproof the ship, fix the controls, and return to the stern section. You must be very tired, Joan, and Jerry also. I am tired, Mother. Well, I have felt a lot more chipper than I do now. But if there's anything to do, well, I can stick around and help do it. Not a thing in the world, Jerry. You run along with Joan and get some sleep. If you can sleep on those thin steel sheets they call beds. If the fatigue is sufficient, those cultures will seem soft. I managed to get some rest on one. The control is now entirely automatic, Captain. Call me if you observe anything you do not understand. Well, I guess I can handle it all, Joan. Uh, wait a minute. How about the radio? Can we use it? I would not attempt to send messages until we have reached a point much nearer Los Angeles. As we descend, it will be more and more difficult for the Euclidians to determine our exact position. So they will easily locate us when we rise to the surface at the end of our journey. I think we can well afford to wait a few hours before sending any messages. Right you are, Joan. Sorry I brought it up. Come on. Let's go back and iron out that steel in those bunks. Don't forget to call us after the four-hour watch. If there should be any extreme vibration of the submarine, you will call me at once, Captain. Right, Joan. I'll go on to sleep and let Pat and me worry. Well, I may be foolish, Tex, but I'm not worrying a great deal. You know, neither am I. Joan knows what she's talking about. If she says we can reach Los Angeles in this thing and be safe as long as we stay near the bottom, well, I know we can do just that. Hmm. But how we must have changed, Tex. All in the few short months since we left home on this cruise to find Joan. Yes, we've seen a lot. Become accustomed to some mighty strange things during that time. Not that submarines are anything new. But this is certainly a far better boat than anything we've got at home. Yes. Better than we have at home. That's what I'm afraid of, Tex. Not pursuit and capture by those scientists. Not G-47 and his threat. I'm afraid because... Well, because there's a terrible fascination in what we've learned. I know just how you feel, Pat. I felt it. But I didn't like to say it. After all our worry and struggle to get back home, I wonder... Will we ever be happy there again? That's just what I meant, Tex. I'm afraid we've we've seen too much to give it all up. Euclidia is a wonderful place. program you are about to hear is largely fiction, science fiction. We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. Exploring tomorrow. And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr., the philosophers down the ages have hassled a long time and with many words about the good, the true, and the beautiful. The true, and, well, that can be defined pretty objectively. But there's a peculiar thing about beautiful. What is beauty? And uh, in whose terms? Makes it difficult. With the story of The Adventure of the Beauty Queen which stars Miss Charlotte Sheffield, Miss United States of 1958. Beauty is a much more complicated problem than the question of truth, actually. A truth is an eternal thing. If it's true, it's true, and that's that. But beauty, beauty is appropriate. It changes as the situations change. It changes with time. I wonder how our own concepts of beauty, that is, our human race's concepts of beauty, will change as time goes by. And uh, let's suppose that a famous young woman of our time, Miss United States, if you like, is awakened in her sleep by an alien presence. A strange force she feels but cannot see. It's something she knows is there. Who are 
you? You know I am here. Yes. Can you see me? No. Nor can I see you. But I am conscious I am with you. Dreams, of course. No. No, it's real. Who are you? A man who in your terms belongs to the distant future. I am unborn in the way you think of it. And to me, you have been dead over a thousand years. Were I back in my own orbit. Someone's playing a joke. No. This is no joke. But please, don't be afraid. I mean no harm. You're dead a thousand years. Wherever you are, what are you talking about? Listen to me. Try to understand. I belong to a race of scientists. In simple words, you can understand. We have a device which enables us to project ourselves into the past. You belong to the past. Do you understand? Yes. The device has made me conscious of you for a long time. I have used it to explore the past, and in these explorations, I have searched for the highest form of human beauty. How do you know whether or not I'm beautiful if you can't see me? The device tells me you're beautiful. Beauty, real beauty, is a force that transmits itself that can be picked up by a form of radar. Please understand, I'm only using terms I think you can follow. In my own orbit, I would not even talk to a child in such simple terms. Go away. Please go away. I can't. I'm in love with you. What? In love with you. In love? Yes. <laughs> Very much. Is it funny? Oh, yes. I don't think it is. But it is. Do women of your time always laugh at a man's love? Oh, don't be silly. I wasn't laughing at you. Well, then at what? I just thought it was very funny. The idea of your being in love with a blip on a radar screen. After all, that's about what I am to you, isn't it? Oh, no. It must be. No, no. The, the radar screen, as you call it, simply picked you up, pointed you out to us. Us? Uh, my associates and I. Oh. I... I felt very strongly drawn to you. I convinced my associates to conduct further experiments. Actual contact with someone out of the past. You. I had to know you. I had to come into orbit with you. Look, don't you think this joke has gone far enough? Well, I told you this is not a joke. Of course it is. Well, you know better. Oh, don't you suppose I know what's going on? Well, I should have thought of it a long time ago. What is going on? Why, well, it's very simple. Someone installed a radio pickup in this room. And you're talking to me through a microphone. Talking to you? You are, aren't you? Oh, no. What do you mean, no? I'm not talking to you in the way you think I am. I'm projecting to you. Oh, please, stop this. But it's not your voice I hear. I'm receiving impulses from you, not actual words. The device I mentioned interprets the nature of your impulses, translates them into my language. It does the same for you. It's true. I don't hear your voice. Not, not as a sound, I mean. You begin to realize. Please stop. No, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You must be insane to say that. I'm, I'm scared out of my life. I want to scream. I, I'm afraid to. I'm not even sure I'm awake. I'm not even sure I'm alive. You're alive. In your century. Now, understand what I'm telling you. In a moment, you'll be drawn out of your orbit, projected into the future, into my orbit. I want to see you. I want to see if you're as beautiful as your impulses say you are. If you are, I'm afraid I'll keep you where I am in the future. <laughs> no. I don't believe any of it. You're mad. Whoever you are, you're quite insane. <laughs> are you receiving me? Yes. Don't be afraid. You're in limbo. On your way into my orbit. X 
Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. All of us, as American citizens, believe in our inherent liberties and freedoms, such as the freedom of the individual to choose and elect his own national representatives. It has been said that there is only one ruling class in America, the people themselves who, through their vote, have established the law of our land. The real importance of this freedom depends on our accepting the responsibility not only to know what we are voting for or against, but also to choose our leaders for the best interests of the nation. So, accept your responsibility and ensure your freedom. Of all things men have discussed and considered today, time is the one of which we know least. We know how to travel in space... And recent physical work has indicated that uh, actually things can travel backwards as well as forwards in time. But we know nothing about it. And one of the things that would be strange on this, how long does it take to travel through time? When you are traveling through time itself, how long does it take to go from now to then? How long was Miss United States in that limbo before she was... There. I'm talking to you. I'm projecting to you. Are you receiving me? Yes. Are you afraid? A little. Not as much as you thought you'd be. No. Have you any idea of where you are? I'm in a room. That's all I know. I'm in the next one. We're on the 500th floor of the Institute of Technical Research in the city of Columbia. In your century, I believe you called it Washington. Washington? You understand, this is America. I'm glad to hear that, at least. Yes, I can see it relieves you. You can see me? Very clearly. And am I? Are you... What? Well, what you expected me to be. To some extent. Do you find me unattractive? Alien. Alien? Uh, different. Yes, I know the meaning of the word. At first I was conscious of a sense of, of shock when I first saw you. At least you're frank. Well, I'm a scientist. Do you find me ugly? I said alien. Of course, I knew you would be. I didn't expect you to measure up physically to our standards. The human form has improved a great deal since your century. But why? Was there a reason? Man-made reasons. Can you tell me? Well, it began with interplanetary wars conducted by the nations of the world. The struggle to build empires in outer space on other planets. When was this? Oh, not in your century. You saw only the first feeble attempts to explore space. Yes, I suppose our attempts are feeble. Well, the interplanetary wars did a great deal of destruction, particularly on this planet. Precious documents, books, records were lost. But there was another result. The atmosphere of the Earth became charged with radioactive matter. For a while, it looked as though the human race had become extinct, but it didn't. The human body acclimated itself to new atmospheric conditions and flourished again. But by that time, our physical form had changed. It changed for the better. And today... Go on. Well, today, the human form is the most beautiful creation has ever seen. And by your standards, I am something of a shock to you. Your physical form was, at first, yes. Am I very different from the women here? Very different. To you, they're beautiful. They are beautiful. Would I find them attractive? I don't think so. I might. Oh, no. Why not? If they're so beautiful, I mean. Well, your conception of beauty is not ours. I understand that, but... But what? Uh, oh, I don't know. I was going to say that beauty is beauty. But that wouldn't make any sense. No, the concept of beauty is what matters. But you said beauty is a force. It radiates. The inner beauty radiates. I, I understand that, too. Well, how do you think of the universe? Oh, I think I associate it with God. 
identify it with the divine mind. I'm surprised. The universe is a reflection of God. Now I begin to understand why, in spite of your physical form, your beauty reached me. And it has nothing to do with your looks. I... I wouldn't be very gracious if I... if I didn't say thank you. I'm going to keep you here, you know, if I can. I don't think you quite mean that. I mean it in every sense. I want you now to... But to remember what I've said about the change for the better in human form. I'm going to open the door to your room and come in. Now, now, please keep in mind that I do not look as the men of your century looked. But also remember that here I'm, well, I'm supposed to be a reasonably good-looking fellow. I... I would like to see you. Well, you will. In the next few seconds. That which is beautiful and befitting, appropriate, depends on the environment it's in. The future people have had to undergo some rather complete changes to meet the environment that, uh, shall we say, we, their ancestors, had imposed on them. A little too much radioactivity. And that which was beautiful is no longer befitting. The thing that is now befitting we might not think of as particularly beautiful. Is it so bad? I'm sorry. I... I... I should not have exposed myself to the shock you feel, to the revulsion you feel at the sight of me. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I... I should have known. Forgive me. I, I just can't look at you for a moment. I have to... I have to adjust. There's a window behind you. You can look out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, please, don't resist me. No, I, I... I was just wondering if you have any idea how incredible to me your revulsion is. Yes, I think I have an idea. Uh, you must overlook what sounds like vanity, but I have to repeat what I told you before. I, I'm supposed to be more than passably good-looking. Yes, I understand. But you can't stand the sight of me. Give me a moment. Are you looking at me? Yes. Does it still hurt you? No. No, I'm too conscious of your inner beauty. I'm very grateful. I'm curious about something. Yes? Are you conscious of any of my impulses? I think so. Do you find them hostile? No. Alien? No. Do they cause you any fear? I don't think so. Well, forgetting how I appear to your eyes, do you like me? Y yes. Yes, I think you must be a very nice person. The curious thing is... Yes? Well, I was going to say, the curious thing is, I'm... I'm still in love with you. You mustn't be. <laughs> Perhaps love is a dimension. I don't know, I... Oh, I'm too confused to think about it. I... Or perhaps it's an orbit we enter or leave. <laughs> I don't know either. I... It was just a thought. You can't examine love through a microscope, can you? Well, it's been exposed to every kind of study for centuries. Even the people of your time knew its reactions to be purely chemical. Of course, your poets didn't agree, but then neither do ours. Do you have poets? Oh, yes, we have them. They resist us. They call themselves the last human barrier against science. They refuse to understand what basic science is. What is it? Well, isn't it man's eternal craving to find out more about the universe, or the divine mind? Let me go back. Go back? Please. How can you even want to go back? Look, what do you see through that window? Nothing but beauty. Miles of emerald green fields with cities that sparkle like diamonds rising out of them. Nothing but prosperity. Prosperity and peace. And you want to go back to your miserable century? To my people. To my own people. I belong with them. I don't belong here. I'll tell you something. We're being observed, listened to by my associates. Observed? 
Well, the final decision must come from them. I'm as much a part of this experiment as you are, even though it was my idea. My idea. My idea. My idea. Now that we've succeeded in drawing you out of your orbit into ours, I... I don't think our science will release you. We can learn a great deal from you about the things of your century. Besides, I love you. I, I want to keep you here. Please! Please don't touch me! Please don't touch me! Dream. That's all it was. That's all it was. It couldn't have been anything else. Couldn't have been. There are parts of beauty that are eternal, that are not not like the physical that changes. But the beauty of a true and honest personality. This sort of beauty, that will endure. There are things that you can rely on as time goes by. Woman needs man, man must have his mate. On this you can rely. The only thing is, the definition of man and woman will tend to change with the passing of ages. But the fundamental things apply. An honest man and an honest woman. These we need forever. Join us for a fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight for Brett Morrison and the real Miss United States of 1958, Charlotte Sheffield. Script was by John Fleming. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Guy Wallace speaking. We pause now for station identification. Presenting the transcription feature, Superman! It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, Mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. But before we join Superman, listen. And now to our story. When a frightened nurse's half-choked scream foiled the leopard woman's daring attempt to kill Max Heller in the emergency ward of the city hospital... The cunning, fearless leader of an oriental spy ring known as the Society of the Leopard decided to try again. Hella, hovering between life and death as a result of a bullet from the leopard woman's gun, might talk if he lived. Might talk too much. He had to die. But now the task was more difficult. Hella had been transferred to a private room guarded by a burly policeman. Two secret servicemen were stationed at the hospital entrance. And Clark Kent newly appointed a special government agent for somewhere in the building. But once again, the mysterious woman's cunning conceived a plan. At the secret headquarters of the Leopard Society, she explained it to Cato, one of her Jap henchmen. It's very simple, Cato. I'm going to be sick, violently sick. We will arrange for a private room at the city hospital and a private nurse. Summon one of our English-speaking friends who has pledged allegiance to the leopard. He will assist me. Simulating pain, the leopard woman was taken to the hospital. Alone with her nurse, she dropped the guise of illness and at gunpoint forced the frightened girl to remove her starched uniform. Take that uniform off. 
I don't carry this gun around to powder my nose with. It works. Get that uniform off or this will be the last nursing job you'll ever handle. Leaving the helpless nurse bound and gagged on the bed, the leopard woman, dressed in a starched white uniform and cap, approached the policeman seated at the door of Heller's room. Good morning. Morning, miss. Oh, don't get up. I'm just going in to have a look at our valuable patient. He hasn't given you any trouble, has he? No, not him. He's out cold. Yes, fortunately. Unsuspected, the leopard woman slips into Max Heller's room, darkened by drawn shades. Moving swiftly to the bed, her supple fingers reach out to fasten on the unconscious Heller's throat. You stupid fool. To think you could ever escape me. No man escapes the leopard. It's too bad you are not conscious. I should like very much to see your eyes as my fingers tighten on your throat. I should like to see your face. You can if you turn on the light. Oh. That was my throat your fingers were fastened on. Hella was moved let, to another room. Let go of me. Oh, no. Let go of me. As you see, sometimes even leopards are caught in traps. No, no. I you can can't. come in now, Joe. Oh, I'm kidding. You the one, Mr. Kent? Yes, turn on the light. Okay. No, you're struggling. It's all over. Put the breakfast on it, Joe. You'll pay for this. You'll pay with blood. Tough baby, ain't you? Yes. Come on, sister. I... These ain't got no diamonds in them, but they oh, shine pretty. My... There we are. Now, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble by going along quietly, leopard woman. You think you're very clever, don't you? you ain't so dumb. You fell for that switch gag, hook, line, and sinker. Fools, both of you. Stupid fools. Take it to headquarters, Joe. I'll pick Major Campbell up and meet you there. First, I've got to see what happened to that nurse. Now, watch her. She's tricky. Don't worry about me, Mr. Kent. She ain't getting away from me. Come on, sister. Dr. Harlow wanted in surgery. Dr. Harlow wanted in surgery. Dr. Harlow wanted in surgery. As I told you a dozen times, Mr. Kent and I can stay here till the cows come home. We have nothing else to do. Are you going to talk or aren't you? I have nothing to say. Uh, see what you can do, Kent. In another minute, I'll slap her insolent face. I can't blame you much, Major. You, uh, you are known as the leopard woman, aren't you? I have nothing to say. You're only making it more difficult for yourself. Don't you realize that? What's your name? I have nothing to say. You said plenty when you were leaning over that bed with your hands on my throat, certain that you were about to murder Max Heller. You had plenty to say then. How you would have liked to see my eyes and my face. And you also said that no man escapes the leopard. Do you remember that? Do you? Now, look here. Just a minute, Major. I'm not going to put up with this for long, Kent. She's a spy, and she deserves no consideration whatsoever. There are ways of making her talk. No, we can always fall back on that. Perhaps we can reason with her, explain a few things. Particularly that we know she shot Max Heller and escaped in his folding wing plane. Naturally, Heller isn't going to feel very kindly toward her once he recovers from the bullet wound. You, uh, you understand that, don't you? I have nothing to say. You understand that Heller, in seeking revenge for your having almost taken his life, will completely expose you. It's just a matter of time... Major Campbell might consent to give you special consideration if you cooperate. Well? I have nothing to say. All right, Kent. We're through handling her with kid gloves. Now let's try something else. I'll take it. Yeah. Hello. Just a moment. You, Major. Oh, thanks. Hello? Oh, yes, Dr. Kingsley. What? No. I see. All right. Yes, I will. Bye. Something wrong, Major? Hella died ten minutes ago. What? <laughs> Stop that insane laughter. Get her out of here, Kent. Lock her up. Come on. Get her out of here, Okay, Mr. Kent. Oh, Hella's death is quite a blow, Kent. I, I was counting on him to clean everything up. Oh, we still have the leopard woman. Oh, she won't spill anything. You can bank on that. Her insolence amazes me. In any other country, she'd be backed up against a wall and a shot. Sometimes I think we treat people too well over here. Major, I'm sure we can figure this thing out. There must be some way of tracking down her spy ring, even if she refuses to talk. Wait a minute. Wait, now, th this may sound ridiculous to you, but it might work. Suppose we let her escape. Ken, are you crazy? No, 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 wait, not entirely. Listen to this. 
If we engineered it so that she could escape without suspecting we helped her along, someone could follow her to wherever the ring's headquarters are. Mm, that's terribly risky. I don't see why. I could trail her without any trouble. Well, you think she'd fall for it? She's smart, you know. Well, we can try. Look, you have a couple of Japanese on your staff, haven't you? Interpreters and translators? Yes. We'll make use of one of them. Well, how? We'll put him in the cell next to hers. She won't be able to see him, but she can hear him. And after all, all Japs sound alike. We'll provide him with a key to the cell door that he can slip to her. The prison guards will have to be told, of course, to keep out of her way when she opens the cell door to let her escape. Then I'll be waiting outside to trail her. You mean we'll be waiting outside? This is my party, too, you no, know. I didn't mean it as a slight, Major. It's just that one man can get around fast. Don't worry about my getting around. I've been doing it for 40 years. I think I know how. Come on. If we're going to try your scheme, let's get going. I certainly hope it works. It'll take a big load off my mind. With the aid of a native Japanese attached to the espionage division of the Secret Service, Kent and Major Campbell set up the trap, baited with an opportunity for the leopard woman to escape. Outside the prison, they wait in a car parked in a dark alley, motor running, and Kent at the wheel. It's been an hour since Moyata was locked up in that cell, Kent. Think something's gone wrong? Oh, no, no, she's too cagey to make a quick break. After all, she doesn't know the way is clear. She thinks guards are walking the corridors. Give her time, Major. I'm trying to give her a rope around her neck. No, I know I'm not supposed to say things like that, but I can't help it. Well, unless I miss my guess, we'll be rounding up quite a flock of spies before the night's over, Major. You won't have to worry about it anymore. At least not as far as the Leopard Society is concerned. I've got six men in a staff car waiting to follow us. They're up the street. Good. I just hope the uh, procession doesn't fight me. Oh, I told them to keep well behind us. Oh. Chances are she'll hop one of those cams over there as soon as she gets out. They're all driven by servicemen. Say, so wait a minute. What about money? Hmm? How can she take a cab without money? Oh, I thought of that. I gave your Jap a $5 bill to wrap the key in. <laughs> nice going, Kent. Keep low, Major. Hmm? Don't move. Here she comes. Oh, I see her. Crossing the street. Hugging the buildings. I would have lost her. No, she's heading for one of the cabs. It not take her long to spot them. I see her now. She's getting in. Let's go, Kent. Not yet. Give the cab a chance to pull away. And there it goes. Okay. Now, what about lights, Kent? We'll run without them. Where's the cab? Just turn the corner. I told those fools not to lose us. We'll run slowly. Don't you worry. There it is, up ahead. Is the other car behind us? Yes, sir. I can't tell... Evidently, you took your cue, running without lights. Oh, that's fine. I guess you sit tight, Major. This is going to work out swell. I hope so, Kent. There we are. She's getting another cab. Going into that building. Motion your other car to come ahead. It's right in back of us. Oh, good. Now, we'll have to close in fast. All right, boys. Remember what I told you. If possible, we want them all alive, particularly the woman. But if you have to, use those Tommy guns. Riley, you and Duncan, wait out front. Okay, well, don't take the rear of the building, and the rest of you, come along with Kent and myself. Come on, let's go. Which house was it, Kent? These brownstones are alike. Third from the corner. That one. Hey, wait a minute. You have no gun, have you? I won't need one. Here we are. Shh. Okay, men. Ready, right, Major. Get set. Is the door locked, Kent? I'll see. No. It's open. Well, it looks as though the society of the leopard is about to be disbanded. Or has the cunning mind of the mysterious leopard woman conceived another surprise for Kent and Major Campbell? Don't miss the next thrilling episode. Tune in and listen, we're the Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. Presenting the transcription feature, Superman! Look, up in the sky!
fly. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. But before we join Superman, listen. And now to our story. Although Clark Kent, by a clever ruse, succeeded in capturing the mysterious Leopard Woman, cunning leader of an Oriental spy ring, nothing was gained. The woman, even though threatened with all manner of punishment, refused to talk. To make matters worse, Max Heller, the foreign agent who might have exposed the spy ring, suffered a relapse and died of the bullet wound inflicted by the Leopard Woman. Up against the blank wall, Major Campbell, chief of the espionage division of the Secret Service, appealed to Kent. It was decided to match fire with fire, cunning with cunning, to let the leopard woman escape from the city prison where she was being held in the hope that she would lead Kent and Major Campbell to the headquarters of the spy ring. As our story continues today, the scheme is working perfectly. Three Secret Service operatives armed with Tommy guns are following Kent and Major Campbell as they approach the brownstone house the leopard woman has just entered. Two more armed men are stationed across the street, and the third is guarding the rear. Listen. Is the door out, Kent? I don't know, Major. I'll see. No, it's not locked. All right, men. Get set. All right, Major. Okay. Open it, Kent. Right. Always pitch dark. I've got a flash. Wait a minute. There. Keep it down low and follow me. Hey, wait a minute. I smell something funny. Hmm? Smell it, Kent? Yes. Incense. I think we'd better separate, Major. Send two of your men upstairs, and we'll comb this lower floor. Good idea. Oh, Harold, stay with us. Kane, you and Johnson, see what you can find upstairs. Okay. There's a room to the right. We'll try that first. Then let O'Hara get up front with his Tommy gun. He can stand alongside of me. I'll shoot the flash into the room. Let me have it. Later. All right. Here, thanks. All set, O'Hara? Yes, sir. All right, I'll swing the door open. <coughs> the room's empty. So it seems. Try that light switch. See if it works. Huh, works all right. But the room has a stick of furniture in it. Yeah. Smell that incense? It's pretty strong in here. I know, Kent, but the room's empty. Well, it hasn't been empty long. Oh, Harry, you run upstairs and see what's doing. Chances are you'll find it deserted. Okay. Kent, you mean the whole house is empty? I'm afraid so. Hey, why are you poking in the fireplace? Ah, these ashes are still warm. In fact, there's a piece of incense still smoldering. That means they haven't been gone long. But, Kent, what about the woman? Where is she? Mr. Kent. Wait a minute. Uh, yes, O'Hara? The rooms are all empty up here. I figured they would be. You can come down. Kent, you said this was the house she entered. It is. Unfortunately, this hall runs right through. She went in the front way and out the back. Well, then she's gone. She stripped us. I don't think that's quite it. What do you mean, not quite it? I don't think she knew the house was empty. Otherwise, why did she come here? Well, to throw us off the scent. She knew we were following her. Uh, possibly. I think there's more to it than that. You'd better have your men make a thorough search of the house anyway. we better get to a phone and call police headquarters. She's wandering around the street. Some prowl car might pick her up. It's worth sending out an alarm. I noticed a drugstore up the street. There must be a public phone there. You start the men searching the house. I'll put the call in on it. Get the car. Major Campbell's office. Who? Well, send him in. It's O'Hara. Oh. They're all through searching the house. Did they find anything? He's coming right in. Oh, yes, O'Hara. Come in. Anything turn up? Just this silver metal. Metal? Yeah, let's see it. Hmm. Japanese letters. Hey, wait, that's not all. Isn't that a crotch leopard in the center? You're right, Kent, it is. Hmm. Probably the medallion of the Leopard Society. Those letters must mean something. Well, we'll find out if they do. O'Hara, get hold of Muyato. Have him translate this. Yes, sir. Well, finding that medallion proves one thing, Major. What? That the brownstone house was the headquarters of the spiring. Well, not a good that does us. You certainly managed to mess things up, Kent. Max Heller dead, the leopard woman at liberty. Nothing to show for our efforts but a silver medal. Just wait till Washington hears about this. If I'm not transferred to the garbage brigade, I'll be very much surprised. Major Campbell speaking. Oh, yes, O'Hara. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me jot that down. All right, go ahead. 
the Society of Leopard. Well, is that all? Right. We had to translate the Japanese letters on the medal. Yes, I heard. The Society of the Leopard, eh? And we let us slip through our fingers like a couple of bungling rookies. No word from the police, I suppose. No. You can bet your bottom dollar they won't pick her up either. She's too smart for that. Probably headed straight for another hideout after giving us the slip. I don't think so, Major. In fact, I'm not quite sure she even knows where the rest of her gang have gone. Oh, now, isn't that a stupid statement? You mean to say they'd clear out without telling her where they were going? Now, look, see if this makes sense. I've been mulling it around in my head ever since we got back here. The leopard woman knew she was running into danger when she made that second trip back to the hospital. If anything went wrong, she couldn't possibly get away, not with the place guarded the way it was. And what's the point? I'm coming to it. Realizing that she might fail, she probably issued instructions that if she wasn't back within a, well, a given number of hours, her gang was to clear out of that brownstone house. And leave her hanging? <laughs> Don't be silly. Now, just a minute. You've got to understand a woman like that. If her plan to do away with Heller failed, as it did... She knew she'd be caught and subjected to questioning, possibly even a third degree. I still don't get your point. Well, it's simply this. Rather than run the risk of having to reveal the whereabouts of her gang if the police put her through a third degree, she made sure she wouldn't know by telling them to pick another hideout of their own choice. Oh, now look, Kent, that doesn't make sense. Here's a woman who's the brains of a spy ring. Well, you mean to tell me she gave her henchmen instructions to clear out without letting her know where they were going? She didn't want to know. In that way, she couldn't ever be forced to reveal their whereabouts, no matter what happened. Well, how is she going to locate them now? Well, they'll communicate with her somehow. Of course, you understand this is all theory. Nothing like it may have happened. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Kent, the only thing that happened was that we handled this assignment like a couple of amateurs. Boy scouts could have done better. Yeah. And where are you going? I'm back to my office. There's nothing hanging around here. I want to think this thing over. I'll walk by the hospital and see how Jimmy Olsen's getting along. I almost forgot about him and all this excitement. Call me if you need me. Well, the chances are we won't need you, Kent. Huh? Thanks very much for your help. You mean I'm through? Well, from now on, I think we'd better stick to the tried and true methods of rounding up spies. I see. All right. Goodbye, Major. Goodbye, Kent. Stung at the sudden dismissal, Clark Kent returns directly to the editorial room of the Daily Planet. As he steps into his office... He finds Lois Lane seated at his desk. Well, look who's here. A long-lost Secret Service man. Come on in. You're a sight for sore eyes. Looks like I've been dispossessed. Not quite. It was too noisy out there, and since nobody knew when you were returning to the fold, I decided to make use of your desk. I'll move this junk out. No, stay right where you are. How's Mr. White? Fine. And Jimmy's getting along swell. I saw him at noon today. Oh. He asked after you. Yeah, I know. I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to think. Well, how does it feel being a big Secret Service operative? Well, it doesn't anymore. I've been fired. No kidding. Uh-huh. Why? No, it's a long, sad story, Lois. I'll save it for some other time. Now, what are you so busily engaged in with all these competitive newspapers here? The Sentinel, the Clarion, the Bugle? Oh, no, I don't know. Someone evidently sent Mr. White a memorandum stating that we weren't getting as much classified advertising as our competitors. So he sat me down to check it. Oh. I'm an expert on help wanted, situations wanted, and miscellaneous merchandise. <laughs> For instance, would you like to buy a complete set of electric Christmas tree ornaments, <laughs> only slightly used? Or uh, a genuine leopard skin? Or a... Uh, what was that last one? For immediate sale, genuine leopard skin. Call 4836. Mm-hmm. When did that ad appear? In tomorrow's Sentinel. Well, this is an advanced copy. Oh. What's all the excitement? Did someone steal your pet leopard and skin it? Oh, we're going to check that telephone number, find out the address, and then go down and buy that leopard skin as husband and wife. Come on. Like it down here at the waterfront, especially with that fog rolling in. Well, it's just another block or two. 410 Front Street. The taxi let us off at the wrong corner. Clark, do you really think that ad has anything to do with the leopard woman? Oh, I don't know. It's just a wild stab. Oh, here's the house. It's vacant. All the windows are boarded up. No, it doesn't mean anything. Come on. There's a light in the upstairs hall. Oh, I told you the boarding didn't mean anything. Hey, watch these steps. They don't look too solid. This is not my idea of fun. I can think of a lot of things I'd rather do. But 
get your Mrs. Jones. Now, this looks like the door. How can anyone live in a place like this? You'd be surprised. Shh, someone's coming. Who is it? Uh, Mr. Brower? Yes? We've come in reference to that leopard skin you advertised. Just a minute. Taking an awful long time to open that door. Oh, how do you do? Come in. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jones. This is Mrs. Jones. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? So, you want to buy the leopard skin? We'd like to see it. Oh, you want to see it? Yes. All right. Wait a minute. I got it in the next room. I'll bring it in. Thank you. Hmm. Strange bird, isn't he? Dog. I don't like this. Well, I can't say we do either. Is Ken's hunch right? Was the advertisement in the paper intended to lead the leopard woman back to her henchman? You'll find out when you hear the next exciting episode, so don't miss it. Tune in and follow the story with Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal, invites you to rocket into the future with Tom Corbett. Hey, good day. Stand by to raise shift. Blast off minus five, four, three, two, one, zero. As roaring rockets blast off to distant planets and far flung stars, we take you to the age of the conquest of space with. Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Far out in space beyond the orbit of Mars, a small rocket scout patrols the blackness of the void holding a steady course back and forth between the asteroid belt and the red planet. This is a ship on Comet Watch, the loneliest tour of duty in the entire Solar Guard. Spaceport Control from Sector 7, Comet Watch, come in. Sector 7 from Spaceport Control, Captain Strong here. Go ahead. Captain Powers reporting. Time 0600, nothing to report. This sector, quiet and empty. <laughs> Sounds as dull as last year's newspaper. Sure is, Strong. Hey, what are you doing on control watch me now? Just filling in. One of the boys is on sick leave. But I'd much rather be here than pulling your duty. Oh, bet. It's enough to make a guy believe in space gremlins. Oh, well, only 12 more days and I'll be relieved. <laughs> Try not to get into any mischief. My chance. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What's up? Just spotted something out there in space. Well, some action for you at last. What is it? Some purple space junk? No kidding, Strong. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. Large, ugly shape, riding in parallel orbit with me. Probably a stray asteroid. Maybe. But did you ever see one on fire? What? Yeah. Looks like thousands of sparks flashing all over it. I'll contact you later, Strong. This time, got to check. Unit reporting for duty is ordered, Captain Strong. All right. Stand easy, cadet. Corbett, what do you know about Comet Watch Patrol? Well, it's a rocket scout that patrols outside the Mars orbit, watching for stray meteors and comets that might cross the space lane. And how does it operate, Astro? Well, the ship has a one-man crew, 
Everything aboard is automatic, including the signal, which is fed right to astrogation service here at the Academy. Manning, can you add anything? All I can say, sir, is that after a 30-day tour of duty like that, you come back talking to yourself. Captain Strong, I may be out of order for asking this, but did you call us in just to quiz us on the Comet Watch? No, Corbett. Just wanted to be sure you had the background of this operation. What operation, sir? Captain Powers on Comet Watch in Sector 7 has failed to report in the last 24 hours. Hey, that sounds like trouble. All Comet Watches are supposed to check in every six hours. Exactly. But what about the automatic tracer beam? Is that cut out, too? No, we're still getting it. The ship is holding its regular patrol orbit. Well, then nothing could have happened to the ship. That's a sin. No, it's Captain Powers. Something's happened to him, and it's our job to find out what. So report to the Polaris immediately and prepare for blast off in exactly ten minutes. <laughs> Long now, Tom. We should sight the scout any minute. Radar bridge control deck, check in. Mm, that may be it now, sir. Control deck, guy. Go ahead, Roger. I got it, Tom. The rocket scout, right on my scanner. Beat it down here, Manning, quick. Hi, right, sir. There she is. You got her. That's the Comet Watch ship, all right. Well, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it, sir. She's not trailing any vapor. See if you can establish audio contact. Right, sir. Rocket cruiser Polaris to Comet Watch. Rocket cruiser Polaris to Comet Watch. Come in, regular. Well, no use, sir. There's no answer. I'm not at all surprised, Tom. Take a look at her. You can see her through the viewport now. Tell me, how does she strike you? From where I sit, sir, that rocket scout reminds me of a ghost ship. Drifting in space. We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So, stand by. Spaceman, have you seen the swell space cadet cutouts you can get on packages of Kellogg's Pep? Boy, they're terrific. Let me tell you about them. On every regular size package of Kellogg's Pep, you'll find a true-to-life photographic cutout of one of your favorites here at Space Academy. Each cutout is a detailed full-length picture, so you can get a close-up view of both the space cadet and an official Space Academy uniform. There's a cutout of Tom Corbett taken on one of his latest adventures. Another cutout shows you Dr. Joan Dale, Space Academy astrophysicist. And besides that, you can get pictures of Space Cadet Roger Manning and Cadet Astro. You want to get all four of these exciting picture cutouts, so don't delay. Go to your favorite grocery store and ask for a regular size package of Kellogg's Test, the build-up wheat cereal. Then, look on the back, and you'll see your Space Cadet picture all ready to cut out. For hanging on the wall, for pasting in scrapbooks, and for trading with your friends, these Kellogg's Pep cutouts are a double-barreled, rocket-blasting, space-travel knockout. And every time you get a package of Kellogg's Pep, you get another picture cutout right on the back. Keep blasting off down to that grocery store till you've got a complete Space Cadet cutout collection. Remember, you get another picture cutout every time you buy a regular-sized package of the Spaceman cereal, Kellogg's Pep. P E P. Pep. Investigating the strange silence of Captain Powers, the Solar Guard officer on Comet Watch Patrol. Captain Strong and the space cadets find the small rocket scout drifting in space like a weird ghost ship. Launching a jet boat, Tom and Captain Strong cross over to the scout and board her. Keep your helmet on, Corbett. Wait till the air pressure in the lock is equal to the pressure in the ship. Of course, sir. Looks like the mechanical equipment of the ship is in good working order. She's cycling all right. Air pressure equalized. Portal open, sir. Good. We can take off these fish bowls and go inside. <laughs> Everything down here seems to be okay, sir. Yeah. Let's go to the control deck. Companionway is uh, through here. Right, sir. Just a minute. Better let me go first. All right, son. Come on. No one here on the control deck. Looks to me like the ship is deserted. I don't think there's been anyone here in days. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. You stay here. I'll go topside. Maybe. Wait a minute. What's that? The hatch. It's opening. That's the hatch, and it leads right into the sleeping quarters. Get ready, Corbett. This may mean trouble. All set. Nobody's coming out, sir. 
All right, you. In there. Come on out. Come out or we'll blast you. Captain Strong, it's only a kid. Jupiter. Well, take care of him, Tom. I'd better, I'd better have a look in here. All right, sir. Well, how in blazes did you get here, Sonny? My, my, my father brought me. Your father? Say, is Captain Powers your father? Yes, sir. I'm Jody Powers. Porter, come in here. Come on, Jody. You stick with me. Yes, sir. What? The... Oh, great galaxy. Is that Captain Powers? Yes, and he's unconscious. My father's been lying there like that for two days, sir. Well, what's wrong with him, Captain Strong? I haven't the least idea, Tom. He has a raging fever and he's delirious. Whatever hit him must have been very sudden and just as violent. He's still in full uniform, even his boots. Looks like he just collapsed. Sir, uh, is my father going to die? He's very sick, son. We'll do all we can to help him. But can you be a real spaceman now and help us? I don't know, sir. I'll try. Well, tell me, when did your father get sick? Two days ago. I woke up and found him lying on his bunk. I tried to wake him up, but I couldn't. Was he all right when you went to bed? Yes, he was fine. He was watching something through the viewport. He was very excited. It must have been that sparkling asteroid that he reported, sir. Did your father always take you along on these trips? It is against regulations, you know. Oh, no, sir, not always. This is the first time. Dad told my Aunt Julia that he wanted me with him this time. He said it wouldn't be so lonely out here if I came along. I see. Well, Tom, whatever caused this, one thing is certain. We've got to get Captain Powers to a hospital and get him there quickly. You take Jody over to the Polaris in the jet boat. I'll rock it back to Earth with Captain Powers in the scout. Alone, sir? Yes, Tom. And until a ship can be set out to relieve you, the Polaris will have to stay on Comet Watch. <laughs> We're having company. Meet Jody Powers. Hello. Huh? A kid. Hey, Jupiter. Of all the blasted... Leave it to you, Junior, to fish something like this out of space. Close your exhaust, Roger. Jody's had enough trouble without listening to your space gas. Who is he, Tom? Captain Powers' son. His father's very sick, so the skipper is blasting back to Earth with him and the scout. Captain Powers needs medical attention fast. But what do we do now? Oh, <laughs> you're going to love this, pal. The Polaris is staying here on Comet Watch until relief. What? And we're taking care of Jody, too. Well, three cheers for the crew of the Polaris. Not only are we stuck with Comet Watch, but the big space heroes have suddenly become babysitters. <laughs> Laughed and I wish that relief ship would arrive. Me too. You realize how long we've been in this tub, Junior? Seeing nothing but these gray walls inside and black empty space outside. Well, what do you want us to do? Arrange a pretty landscape out there for you? And that kid, Jody. What about him? He's getting in my hair. Why does he always have to tag after me? Ah, he's just lonesome. And he happens to like you. Why? I'll never know. Well, do us both a favor and keep him out of my hair. He's getting to be a pet. Hey, there goes your space jump warning. You better get a fix and report to spaceport control. Yeah, one of these days I'm going to let a meteor plow right in a Commander Arkwright's window. And listen, remember what I said. Keep that kid off the radar, bridge. <laughs> I don't know. When they gave Manning a heart, they must have carved it out of a Martian ice cap. Hello, Tom. Oh, hello, Jody. What have you been doing? Just looking around on the power deck. Hey, how about something to eat? No, thanks. I'm not very hungry, Astro. Yes, Roger. Up on the radar bridge. May I go up there and visit him? I think you better stay down here with us for a while. I'd rather go up there. I'm sure Roger will be glad to see me. Oh, sure. He'll be so happy, he'll blow his jet. I'll see you later, fellas. <laughs> what are you going to do? We make a fuss over him and he brushes us off. Roger pushes him around and the kid worships him. <laughs> Sighted on orbit, cutting space cave three. That is all. End transmission. Hello, Roger. Are you here again? I thought I told you to stop following me. I know. But if I just sit here real quiet, can I watch you work the radar scanner? Ah, that's not big, kid. You know, I'll bet you're the best astrogator in the whole academy. Well, look, I wouldn't say that. Captain Strong's pretty good, too. That pulled this crew out of plenty tight squeezes. Yeah, lucky to have you on there, crew, Roger. You're a real spaceman. Yeah, I... 
Hey, what am I gassing with you for? I got work to do. Come on, I'm taking you down to the control deck, and this time you stay there. Oh, go blow your jet. And don't let me catch you. Huh? Stab your tube, Manny. Why, you little... <laughs> hey, you've got spirit. You know, you're not such a bad kid as that. I think I'm beginning to like you. You are? Yeah, I guess you and me can do business together. But not right now. It's way past your sack time. Oh, you heard me, Junior, and a good space cadet always obeys orders. A space cadet? Me? Well, space cadet J.G. Now, come on, let's blast. I'll take you below. Say, isn't that your space junk warning? Yeah, it's probably just another pebble. Forget it. Well, shouldn't you report it? I can do that later. Now, cut the stalling. You're going to sack in this minute. Come on. Great galaxy, Tom, did you ever see anything like that in your life? No, it looks like the whole asteroid is shooting off sparks. Hey, turn that alarm off, will you, after all? Sure thing. You think we'd better check Roger and make sure he's reporting it back to spaceport control? No, whatever you say about that joker, at least he's always on the ball. I wouldn't bet my life on it. Hey, Astro, I just remembered something. Huh? What? Captain Strong told us that in the last audio contact he had with Captain Powers, Powers reported seeing a strange asteroid. An asteroid that shot off sparks. Hey, that's right. You think there's a connection? Oh, I can't be sure. But this better be reported to the skipper, too. Okay, I'll tell Roger to start calling. You tell me to what? Roger, what in blazes were you doing below? Putting Jody to bed. And no wisecracks, Astro. That kid's okay. Then you haven't reported that meteor. What meteor? Look out there, bubblehead. See it? It's drifting away from us now. Yeah, what's so important about that? Are you space happy? That's the same meteor Captain Powers saw when he made his last report. The one that looks like it's on fire. Oh, so what? There's plenty of time to report it. How? You didn't even get a fix on her. Now you can't project her orbit. It's too late. Stop using your tubes. It isn't that important. Nine out of ten of the meteors we report don't go anywhere near the space lane. This won't be any exception. Why, the rings of Saturn. Sometimes I could take you yeah, and what? you could take me and what? Hey, hold it, you two. We're getting a call on the teleceiver. Rocket cruiser Polaris. Cadet Tom Corbett here. Go ahead. Corbett, this is Captain Strong. Well, yes, sir. How's Captain Powers? Did you get him back in time? He was still alive when I landed, but that's about all. The medicals are doing their best for him now. You'd better not tell Jody anything until we're sure, one way or the other. Of course, sir. Tom, don't forget to tell him about that meteor. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, Corbett. The main reason I called you is about that meteor. Uh Uh-oh. Yes, sir. I was just going to... If you see it, I want you to stay clear of it. What? We're not sure, but we think it caused Captain Powers strange illness and the death of three other Solar Guard officers in the past 15 years. What about our release, sir? Come and watch patrol in Sector 7. It's to be temporarily abandoned. We're not taking any chances. What is that, your orders? Yes, sir, but... That's all. In transmission. Fellas, did you hear that? Yeah, every word. And our pal Roger here let that blasted meteor go by without charting its orbit. Heaven help any ship that gets near it. Turn to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett's Space Cadet in just a moment. So stand by. Listen to the powerful blast off of a giant rocket cruiser flashing up, up, up into the heavens. There's power for you. The roaring drive of a rocket bursting through Earth's gravity off into space. The men who ride those rockets have to be in top flight physical condition or else. Now that's why all space cadets call for Kellogg's Pep. Here's Cadet Astro to tell you in his own words how Kellogg's Pep helps to keep the space cadets ready for action. Cadet Astro here. Kellogg's Pep does help the space cadets keep ready for action. And Pep can help you spacemen the same way. Now all spacemen need vitamins and energy food values to keep up steam for a busy day. And when you eat Kellogg's Pep every morning, you're getting a head start with a swell supply of sunshine vitamin D and vitamin B1. Now Pep also gives you the rugged nourishment of whole wheat with the wheat germ left in. (laughs) As a matter of fact, Kellogg's Pep gives you more of these build-up food values than any other wheat flakes. Say, it's no wonder the space cadet bank on Kellogg's Pep for a quick morning blast-off. You just tackle a bowl full of Kellogg's Pep tomorrow morning, like I do. Then you'll be starting your day the spaceman's way. Hear that, spaceman? Eat the same kind of breakfast Astro and all the cadets do. And when you get your package of Kellogg's Pep... 
Look for your exciting Space Cadet cutout. Remember, there's another picture of one of your favorite Space Cadets on the back of every package of Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P. Pep. Learning that Roger's neglect of duty has endangered the space lanes of the Solar Alliance, the crew of the Polaris rockets after the strange and deadly sparkling asteroid to warn all space traffic away. Now, after hours of tension, the boys slowly begin to relax, feeling their job has been done. Control deck to radar bridge, check in. Radar bridge, aye. Picking up any other ships on your scanners, Roger? No, none for the last hour. How about the meteor? Still have it. Old present speed and distance. I'm keeping it far away from it. You've plotted the orbit and reported it to spaceport control, haven't you? Yeah, no. I guess they've warned all space traffic by now. No, and I guess we can head back to the academy. But the skipper will sure chew us out for being late. What are you going to tell him? Oh, think of something, I guess. Let's worry about that when we land. Thanks, Tom. Ah, forget it. Give me a new heading now. Right. Hey, what's going on down there? What do you mean? We're closing in on that meteor fast. Oh, that's impossible. We haven't changed speed or course. It's a cinch the meteor hasn't. Better check Astro, quick. Remember what the skipper said about getting too close to that thing. Stand by. Control deck to power deck. Check in, Astro. Yes, Tom. Right here. Well, what's going on, Astro? Roger report, we're closing in on the meteor. You giving me more power? Yeah, but I can't help but the master speed control is jammed. How did that happen? Well, that cute little passenger of ours, Jody. He was fooling around down here. Loosened one of the brackets and the control lever slipped out of gear. Well, can't you fix it? I'm working on it right now, but it'll take me at least ten minutes. Roger, you hear that? That's too long, Astro. We'll be on top of the meteor in three at this rate. Well, cut your rockets, Astro, all of them. That won't do any good. Our momentum will carry us along at the same speed. And we can't turn fast enough with just steering vanes. Better make up your mind fast, Tom. Those sparks are getting big. Well, there's only one chance. Astro set steering vanes hard over to port. Hard over, right. Now, stand by forward braking rockets. Ready? What's going to lead to, Tom? We can't turn fast enough. I think we can if we fire starboard torpedoes. Stand by main battery, Roger. Okay. All set. Last nose rockets, Astro. Here goes! <laughs> All right, Roger, get set. Give me the word, pal, but fast. Main battery, salvo, fire. Now, fellas, just pray as hard as you can. Control that to radar, Bridge. Give me a report, Roger. We're clear, Tom. Is almost off my scanner. Wow. Don't want to do that again. You feel sick or anything? No. How about you? Just fine. I guess we cleared it okay. Be right down. Okay. All right, Jody. You just get up here and tell Tom what you did. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Honest, I didn't. Whether you meant it or not, you almost got us into a barrel of trouble. It was Jody, all right, Tom. Well, what have you got to say for yourself, Jody? I'm sorry. I was down there and making believe I was a space cadet and... Oh, golly, I won't ever do it again. Well, if you're trying to be a space cadet, you ought to be disciplined the way cadets are. The discipline? Yes, Jody, demerits, mess patrol, scrub detail, the work. I got a better idea. The flat of my hand on the seat of his britches. Over my dead body, Junior. Well, that can be arranged, too, Roger. Don't let him spank me, Roger. Don't. He won't lay a finger on you, kid. <laughs> well, what's come over you, Roger? Nothing. He's only a kid. He didn't know any better. And he said he was sorry. What more do you want? Oh, I give up. But from now on, keep him off my power deck. Don't worry, I will. That hole you're working isn't any good for his health. He might grow up to be like you. Oh, great. Here we go again. Hey, teleceiver call. Uh Uh-oh. I bet it's Captain Strong wondering where we are. Rocket cruiser Polaris, Cadet Corbett here. This is Captain Strong. What's holding you up, Corbett? You're overdue. Oh, sorry, sir. We uh, had some mechanical trouble. We're on our way now. All right, but make it fast. Captain Powers is recovering. He told us a lot more about that meteor. It must be destroyed as soon as possible. As soon as you land, the Polaris will be outfitted for a new operation. The destruction of the sparkling meteor. Don't miss the next action-packed adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, on Thursday. 
when the crew of the Polaris rockets toward a deadly trap in part two of The Mystery of the Sparkling Meteor. Tune in same time, same station on Thursday for the next thrilling interplanetary adventure with Tom Corbett. Face to death. Brought to you by Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, starring Frankie Thomas, can also be seen on television and appears in the comic sections of many of America's leading newspapers. Look for it daily and in weekend editions. Featured in today's cast are Jan Merlin, Al Markham, Edward Bryce, and Sarah Fussell. Today's program was written by Jack Weinstock and Willie Gilbert, directed by Drex Hines. Jackson Beck speaking. And what a secret. In Kellogg's Raisin Bran, the tasty raisins are dipped in honeycomb. That means plumper, more tender raisins, along with delicious golden crisp bran flakes. Both fruit and cereal all in one box. And no other raisin bran but Kellogg's gives you the tender goodness of raisins dipped in honeycomb. That's Kellogg's secret. So for your breakfast, make sure you get Kellogg's because... This program came to you from... Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are in command of a ship sailing with sealed orders into an ocean fraught with danger, while the enemy whom you seek is lying in wait for the moment when they will close in and strike, leaving you no escape. Listen now as Escape brings you Anthony Ellis' exciting story, Clear for Action. <laughs> Anchor, sir. Uh, convoy, Mr. Secretary. Uh, better than that. You are familiar with these waters? I know the Caribbean as well as my own quarter deck. Excellent. Somewhere in these waters, there is a French sloop of war, the Harfleur. From all available reports, she carries 20 guns, more or less. And she has taken or sunk at least 10 of our merchantmen. She has to be stopped. We cannot at this time afford war with either France or England. Therefore, you will under no conditions attack unless absolute proof is offered of an aggression against one of our ships or your own. Oh, exactly. But she'd hardly be likely to open fire on a merchantman under our noses, sir. She would not, Captain. But those are your orders. Yes, sir. When do I sail, sir? You will proceed with all haste to the Bahamas Group vicinity. The half lord seems to operate from a base situated near there. Very well, sir. I wish you luck, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> Right. 
Good morning, sir. Mr. Quinn. Morning, sir. Mr. McCrake, you've charted the course. I have. Good. We'll get on the way immediately. Square away. <laughs> We should be sighting the island soon, huh? Aye, sir. You will have lookout keep a sharp watch. Aye, sir. Now, thank you to order gun crew exercise again this morning. Aye, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Jonathan. Making about seven knots, sir. Ah, excellent. At this rate, sir. Quartermaster! Also, your course, two pints of tabard. Two pints of tabard, sir. He's a big one, sir. Close yes. hauled, coming up fast. Better than a frigate, I'd say, sir. And you make her colors! Don't get her! Don't the quarters, please, Mr. McCrake. Aye, aye, sir. All hands to quarters! Ship of the line, sir. Seventy-four guns if he carries one. Ah, that's what I like. Close on. I want no trouble with him, Mr. McCrake. But we'll have gun crews to that station. I'll attend to it myself, sir. And I pray that she fires on it. I don't like it, Captain. She must have seen our colors by now. She's laying a course to pass within range. Probably wants to hail us. Nothing more. <laughs> Your Linstock, Candy. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. McCrake, on the quarter deck, if you please. He's shortening sail. Yes. Well, come about, Helm. All right, sir. Mr. Quinn, my speaking trumpet, please. Good. Thank you. Sir, if they let go with a broadside, we're done for. Those must be 42 pounders. Mr. McCrake, I'm aware of that. Well, it's such a fat on course, Captain, and I'll blow on the kingdom come. Mr. McCrake, unless you have a desire to join the midshipmen, you will allow me to give the orders. Back the main topsails! We'll heave to, Mr. McCrake. But, sir, we... We'll... Heave to, Mr. McCrake. I shall. Heave to! Ahoy! Oh, United States Frigate Panther of 36 men, Captain Christopher Steele. Princess, sir, that would be Rear Admiral Gray. Flagship of the West Indies squadron, huh? You'll no doubt be wanting to put a first gang aboard her. Don't worry, Duncan. Yeah, I served with them once, and I'll happily kill the first man who tries to make me do it again, sir. The only way any of my men leave this ship is over my dead body. Have the men stand to quarters, Jonathan. I sir. You're not going to pipe them over the side, are you, sir? I am not, Duncan. Yeah, oh, here they come. Will you look at that dip squeak standing at the stern? <laughs> that Duncan is an officer of His Majesty's Navy. Hey, the lips has always been glued together. Ship your now, Duncan, control yourself. Not a word out of you. That's an order. Aye, sir. Thank you, my man. Captain Steele? Yes? Lieutenant Simpson of His Majesty's ship, Princess. What can I do for you, Lieutenant? I shall come to the point, sir. What are you doing in these waters? I do not see that that concerns you, Lieutenant. England is at war, sir. Any ship concerns us. So I have noticed. Exactly what do you mean by that, Captain? Only that my government has been well aware of your impressment of American seamen into the British Navy. That is a lie. We impress only English deserters. A questionable point, Lieutenant. As a matter of fact, Captain, I have orders to search your ships for just such men. Impossible. I... I beg your pardon? No, Lieutenant, you may not search. This is the warship of the United States Navy, and may I remind you that only by my courtesy are you at this moment aboard. I... The I... interview is over, Lieutenant. You may return to your ship. Why, I... Mr. McCrake, you will escort Lieutenant Sampson over the side. I, I sir, warn you, Captain. Come along, Lieutenant. This position will work. This will find him with Admiral Grave. Please send my compliments to the Admiral and tell him that if I ever catch him molesting American ships, I shall consider it an act of piracy. 
and we'll see that he hangs from his own yard arm. Well, we shall see about that. I'll have to sit here this time. Our guest is away, sir. <laughs> yes, Mr. Quinn, yes. All right, squat away. We're wasting time. Why, sir? Where's that, that man, sir? Hands to the hand, yes! Wait it up! Oh, uh, uh, disappointing. We are stuff open fire. She's a wonderful target. Yes, but so are we, Doctor. You'll get your fight, all right, but with a higher floor. Ah. Now I don't want to miss my breakfast. Call me when the island's in sight. Islands for two days now. Do you think she'd be lying in so close? The British would have spotted her. I will take no chances, Jonathan. Fire the mark! Sail, sir! Yeah, 7-7. Mr. McQuake, we'll shorten sail again. Fire Shows are dangerous here, Buster. I wonder if... Now, oh. oh, there, Jonathan, there. Be on that sand stick, you see? Yeah, I see her. Yes, but that's not the half floor. On the cut, I would judge she's a brig. All right, indeed. She's showing fast, sir. Well, whatever she is, she must be a brown. We'll run in as close as possible. I want to look at her. And the half floor. Sir, don't you think it... Don't you think it... Yes, Jonathan... Nothing, sir. A fire Oh, Ah, good. All right, we'll like her here. Aye, sir. He too. Mr. McBrick. Aye, sir. Put the cutter over side and get me a crew. Let's hold the anchor. Oh, sir. Smith. Brennan. Hartley. Jacob. Philip. Muskets and side arms. That's the cutter. Ship secure, sir. Jonathan, you will keep us covered with a bow chaser. Aye, sir. You think it might not be a trap? Well, it might, but we'll chance it. Watch for my signals. If you sight the Frenchman, put out immediately. Aye, sir. Duncan, leave your sea legs here. We're going ashore for a little walk. <laughs> Turn to escape in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, the Lux Summer Theater stars Fred McMurray. Listen on most of these same CBS radio stations tomorrow night. The Lux Summer Theater. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> to be alive, I can tell you, sir. Making as peaceful a voyage as you could wish for, bound home for Providence, when we run into a Frenchie. Ah, Fleur, we've been searching for her. Uh, she hit our mizzen when we refused to heave to. Hmm. Luckily, a squall came up and we lost her. Uh, you were fortunate, Captain. Uh, I put in here for repairs. We hit the shoals and run aground. Uh, we're in a mighty fix. How are your repairs proceeding? Well, as you see, you're rigging a jury mast now. Bottom's down right enough. But what's a peaceful ship to do, I ask you, sir? Hard being neutral these days. Well, they are difficult times, Captain. However, rest assured you will reach port safely. I hope so, sir. I hope so. My cargo is valuable. Now, she certainly looks trim. She is, sir. Sweet craft. Ah. I wonder, sir. Oh, just a thought, my great. Just a thought. Ah, there's my daughter. She'll be happy your, to uh, you. Your daughter, sir? Certainly. Always sails with me. Fine sailor. Aha. Uh -huh. Jennifer! Yes, Father. I want you to meet Captain Steele of the Panther, lying out yonder. A great pleasure, Captain. Miss Matthews, this is Lieutenant McCrake. You gentlemen are a welcome sight. Why, thank you, ma'am. The Panther's after that Frenchie, the half floor she saw. Your father tells me you had a brush with her. Oh, yes, that scurvy, blasted... Doctor! <laughs> Forgive me, Captain. I forgot that ashore I am a lady. 
Or at least supposed to be. Uh, why, ma'am, I hadn't noticed otherwise. That, sir, is the prettiest speech I have heard nigh on to eight months. <laughs> uh, Captain Matthews, may we go aboard your vessel? Of course. I should like to further discuss the situation with you. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Your health, sir. And yours, sir. <sighs> now, sir. <laughs> Captain, how would you like to square accounts with the hot world? I should like that, sir. I should like that very well. Well, a plan occurred to me, you're sure. Uh, I must warn you, though, that there's an element of danger both to you and your ship. Without your presence here, we'd probably never see America again. The Frenchman's still searching for us, there's no doubt. Yes, exactly. But let us suppose that you became a decoy, the bait in a sea trap. Go on, sir. Go on. I think we may safely presume that Harfleur does not know of the existence of my ship here in the Caribbean. Now, with your permission, I propose... Thank you, Mr. McCrick. Handsomely, mister, handsomely. A round of grog for your men with my compliments. Aye, right, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll see you. Four guns, Captain. Four guns where there should be none. Yes, but they must remain well hidden until needed. Sir. I couldn't have believed it. Four guns from your own ship to the old Salem. Oh, that Frenchman. Well, we shall see, sir. And now I suggest that we observe Miss Jennifer's progress below. Huh? Aye. <laughs> What a tale this will make. Please, please, Mr. Quinn, stand still. Oh. <laughs> you make a powerful-looking woman, Lieutenant. Father. <laughs> there. How do you like it, Captain? A delightful sight. Mistress Quinn, my compliments. No, sir. Miss Jennifer, there is no seamstress in Boston to equal you. Why, thank you, Captain. Uh, uh, we shall go over the plan again, eh? Mr. McCrake, below if you please. Hi, sir. Ah, now then. Mr. Quinn and I will stay aboard the Salem with Captain Matthews. Well, it's all six years done back, sir. Uh, why, Mr. Quinn, what uh, a perfectly beautiful guy. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Quinn is aware of his beauty. We have business, Mr. McCrake. Hi, sir. Now, we shall need 20 good men from the Panther, besides the gun crews already with us aboard the Salem. Mr. McCrake, you will be in command of the Panther. If possible, remain within masthead sight of us. Aye, sir. Miss Jennifer will sail with you. Aye, aye, sir. Yes. Mr. Quinn and the gun crews will be dressed in female costume and will make themselves plain to sight on deck. I hope that will lull the Frenchmen into a sense of security and trust that they will not run out their guns. Good, good. Go on, sir. Now, Salem's four cannon will be hidden. And to all appearances, she is still the peaceful merchantman. And this time, when the half Lewis sights us, we heave too. Yes, correct. You'll no doubt send a boarding party. Yeah. And then our ladies engage the boarders, supported by myself and the rest of the men. And I think that is all. It is to be hoped, gentlemen, that after these preparations, your enemy obliges with her presence. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now, Mr. McCrake, we'll catch Salem off the shoal immediately, if you please. Hi, sir. Mr. Quinn, you may remove your gown now. Oh, thank you, sir. And give the men from Panther their orders. I should like to get underway as soon as possible. <laughs> Clear, Mr. McQuick? Aye, sir. Very well. And, uh, good luck, Duggan. And you behave yourself. <laughs> aye, aye, sir. Good luck to you. Captain Matthews. Thank you, lad. Goodbye, Father. Captain Steele, would you honor me by wearing this ribbon on your sword? 
Right. I would be honored, ma'am. Thank you. Goodbye, Captain. Uh, Mr. McClake. Hi, sir. Uh, uh, Miss Jennifer, would you allow me to assist you over the side? Thank you, Lieutenant. I'll take good care of myself. Mr. McCraig? Yes, sir. Well, Captain Matthews, will you give the order to make sail? Aye. Right. Fire the way! And the bonus to the first man to sight the Frenchman! Still in these waters, Captain, we'll find her. Never thought I'd be praying to see a Frenchie, but at this minute I'd give it. Steady as you go, Helen. Aye, as you go, sir. Master Quinn! Aye, right, sir. Get your men into their costumes lively now. Aye, right, sir. Yes, that's her. That's our ship, all right. Mr. Quinn, keep the men away from their guns. We want to arouse no suspicion. She's seen us. She's taking over. Aye. You men below, we've started the chase. Stand the quarters. I want no sound until I give the signal. Helm. Aye, sir. We'll broach two. Make her think we're rattled and clumsy and trying to put about. Aye, sir. That'll bring our guns to bear on the starboard side, Captain. Good, good. All right, let her fall off, Helm. Easy. Easy now. All right, port a little. Steady. Steady. Ah, oh, well done, man. Steady as you go. Steady as you go, sir. Ready, sir. <laughs> well, most fetching, Lieutenant. Ah. Here, let me adjust your bonnet for you. Yeah, that's better. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that pistol, Lieutenant, makes a bulge where it seems to me no bulge should be. Oh. Well, we... Uh, better, sir? <laughs> You're a picture of femininity. Now, as soon as the half floor comes up, we heat too. Have your men very distracted. In other words, behave like women, mister. In the line of duty in seeing you order it, sir, I'll do it. <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. You know what to do when they board. I sir. All right, take up your station. <laughs> uh, I pity the Frenchman who comes over the side to meet Mr. Quinn. And I, sir, and I. Back your sail! We're heaving to! She's on, Mr. Beam. Don't worry, Captain. They want this ship as a prize. She's already put over a longboat. And another one's coming around from the port quarter. I'd be obliged, sir, if you'd go to your cabin. This is our work. No, sir, this is my ship. I'm not young anymore, but I won't miss this fight. Very well, sir. Then I suggest that you look for the priming of your pistols. Get ready. Here they come. Hello. Where is your captain? What's the meaning of this? We're a neutral vessel, American. This ship is a prize of L'Empereur Napoleon. You will strike your colors. Not while I'm alive. Mr. Quinn, return for Here's your prize, Frenchie! I think we may have scored a hit. What shall I do with the prisoners, sir? Have them taken below. Uh, we'll transfer them to the Panther. Panther! Panther! 
Ah, and none too soon. Our floor is wearing it to rake us. We'll be in trouble if she can. Captain, that's your ship closing in. Yes, the Frenchman's seen her too. Look, look, she's standing up. She's done. Get to your guns, Mr. Quinn. Aim for a mass. We might get a lucky hit. Right. Out of starboard! Out of starboard! She's running, Trapper! Open fire, Mr. Quinn! Open fire! She's hit! Look, Captain! There goes a missile! She's hit! Well, I think Panther can take over now. Stand by to go, boat! Break up the canvas! a wonderful dinner. Yes, it was indeed, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Captain Steele. Hmm? Did you enjoy it, too? Uh, 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 yes. Yes, of course, Miss Matthews. <laughs> Very tasty. Very. Well, I was just thinking it's, uh, it's getting late. Oh, no, Captain. You don't have to go yet. Why, of course not, ma'am. I'm afraid so. Mr. Quinn stands watch aboard the Panther tonight, and you, Mr. McRake, have uh, repairs to make on the hot floor. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. We'll uh, stay home, too, tonight. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, good night, Miss Matthews. Good night. I- I'd uh, willingly join the crew of Salem for such cooking as yours. Oh, why, thank you, Lieutenant. Um, <laughs> uh, good night, ma'am. Good night, Lieutenant Quinn. Hey, uh... Are you coming, sir? Uh, why, yes, gentlemen, of course. I... But, Captain, don't you remember? You promised to tell me of your exploits at sea. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Good night, Duncan. Aye, sir. Good night, sir. Jonathan. Good night, sir. Well, Miss Matthews, I... Jennifer, uh... Captain. Jennifer. And now, supposing you start by telling me of your exploits. Escape has brought you Clear for Action, written and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring William Conrad as Captain Steele. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, John Daner, John Stevenson, Tudor Owen, Vivi Janice, Richard Peel, and Dave Young. The special music for Escape is composed and directed by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are running from an unseen enemy... Frightened and alone, living from day to day, while your pursuer, unrelenting and murderous, is gaining on you, ready to trap you in a place from which there is no escape. So listen next week when Escape brings you Charles Smith's exciting story, The Far Away Island. where CBS Radio has been bringing you its productions of suspense, listen for the gripping new mystery called Crime Classics. Premier performance this Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evening on the CBS Radio Network.
Rice checks and wheat checks for bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages. Present Space Patrol. <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are in their spacesuits aboard a wrecked spaceship, stranded on a meteor. Through the nose port, they watch an enemy spaceship land. It's Smeet's ship, all right, Commander. Have your ray gun ready, Happy. We'll give him a fight. Yes, sir. Yeah, they're shining some sort of light on us. Wow, what a glare. Don't look at it. Some kind of special ray. Drop to the deck. I can still see the light, even with my eyes shut. It's burning into my brain. Why did Hap keep low? Commander, uh, everything's turning black. We can work our way aft and get some shielding between us and that ray. Oh, it's no use, Commander. I can't move. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting space patrol adventure, Invasion from Tirana. <laughs> Hey, Space Patroller, what do you see peering through your periscope? Hi, it can't be too, Bill. I'm spying on the mailbox around the corner. I'm spying on my pals. All of them dropping letters into the box. You know what they're sending away for? The swell Space Patrol periscope? Ah, uh, you bet, Captain. Well, Space Patrollers, you better take a tip from our pal here and send for your Space Patrol periscope today. And I don't want any of you to miss out on the neat fun you can have spying through the eye of your own periscope. That magical mirror that lets you see around corners and trees, over fences and bushes, but nobody can see you. You can see right over the heads of real tall people, too. Because the periscope's 24 inches high and tapered special for wide-angle vision. And you'll like the keen periscope colors, too. Blue, yellow, and red. And don't forget, Captain Peefill, there's a special identification chart of outer space patrol printed right on the periscope and a place for your name... Address and solar system. Yes, it's plenty terrific. So, gang, hurry and send for yours right now. Remember, this is the last time we can offer you the Space Patrol Periscope. Send a rice checks or wheat checks box top, together with your name, address, and 25 cents in coin, to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Don't forget your 25 cents. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, Invasion from Tirana. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are in their star drive spaceship, cruising far beyond the orbit of Tirana 15, outermost planet of a remote solar system in the constellation Pegasus. With their Space Patrol periscope, they're observing Tirana's preparations for the coming attack upon the United Planets. Right now, the instrument is focused on a vast spaceport near the capital city of Tirana. Wow. There must be a hundred spaceships there, Commander. And all star drive jobs from the looks of them. That's just one spaceport. Maybe ten more on other planets with just as many ships. Well, how are we going to locate them all, sir? It would take months to, to search all 15 planets with just this one periscope. We can't hope to find out how many ships are going to attack. We'll be lucky if we can find out when the invasion starts. And the only warning we'll get is when we see some of those ships blast off. Then we're going to star drive and return to the United Planets. That means the space patrol will get only a few minutes warning. I'm sure wish our space patrol would work through hyperspace. Well, that wouldn't help much, Hap. Those ships went to Star Drive, they'd reach our solar system right behind the warning. Now, let me see if I can locate General Mogner's headquarters with the periscope. Well, it's a building east of the spaceport, according to what we picked up from the spy of his while we were captured. Yeah. Had we got the microfilm camera for the periscope, may be able to photograph some Tyranian documents. Well, that won't do much good, sir. We can't read Tyranian. No, but back on Terra, there are a couple of captured Tyranian spies that can translate for us. Yeah, that's right. And the brain graph can tell us whether they're telling the truth or not. Elsewhere, in his headquarters on Tirana 7, capital tenant of the enemy solar system, General Mogmir, chief of the Tiranian intelligence section, goes over invasion plans with the spy, Kosuri, known to Buzz and Happy as Matthew Smee. I have just received word from Central Command on our task units on eight other planets already for Mark. Then uh, we are waiting for a unit here on Tirana 7. Yes, Kosuri. The ships of the command unit are being loaded with supplies now. Look. Mark this date on the calendar, Kosori. This is the date of our attack on the United Planets. Yes, General. And uh, I trust I am being considered for a suitable command in the occupation forces? I'll consider that matter after our next campaign. Our next campaign? Yes. 
After the United Planets are under control, Savannah will launch an offensive against Bart. What? Bart is a star just eight light years from our system. Its planets are inhabited and developed to a high degree in technology. Why haven't we attacked it before? Because we weren't sure we could conquer it. Latest reports, however, show that the people of Arkel are entirely peaceful. Despite their scientific advancement, they should be easier to defeat than the United Planet. I'll go over our plan in peace. Well, Commander, it's all on microfilm. But I don't see that it'll do us much good. It's too bad we couldn't hear what the General and Smeed were talking about. It would be in Turanian language anyway. Huh? Still, I've learned something important. You have, sir? What? In the periscope, we could see a chart of our solar system and the Turanian calendar. General Mugnir pointed to a date two days off. Very likely that's the date of the invasion. Two days? Well, that's more time than we expected. Well, wait a minute. How do you know that was a calendar? I picked up a little Turanian during the past few weeks from the spies we captured. Naturally, I can't translate any of their documents, but I know their number system. And I know how they measure time. That was a calendar. Mm. And we've got two days' warning. No, less than that. One day in Tavana 7 is much shorter than a 24-hour period in our solar system time. In fact, it's just a little more than six hours. Wow. Then two days, Tirana time is about 12 hours in our solar system. Right. But from watching General Morgan here at that star chart, you've got a pretty good idea where the attack will originate. Yeah. But he was pointing to some other part of space, a lot nearer to Tirana than our solar system. I noticed that. There's a star about eight light years in Tirana. If Morgan was talking about it at this time, I'd say it was either an ally of Tirana or their next victim. Commander, look. Isn't that a spaceship in the viewscope? Yes, probably a Turanian patrol ship. It's a long ways off. Not a cross vector. I don't think they've seen us yet. With increased velocity into the star drive. Huh? Hey, what's that? Get a directional fix in that signal. Yes, sir. Sounds like some sort of automatic code. Yeah. Too simple for a message. Could be a warning or a sign that we've been picked up by a Turanian patrol. I don't think it's coming from that other ship, Commander. It seems to be coming from about 15 degrees off our starboard. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've got it fixed, sir. Is that distress signal is originating at 16.5 degrees off our present heading. I'll adjust the viewscope, Pat. So why do you call it a distress signal? Hmm? Gee, sir, I don't know. It just popped into my head, that's all. You may be right. Look at the starboard viewscope. It's a meteor. Yes, look what's on it. Spaceship. A Turanian ship must have cracked up. And their space opponent is sending out an automatic signal. Mm, that could be. Take a look at that ship. Doesn't look like any Turanian spacecraft I've seen. It sure doesn't. And, and there are probably a lot of planetary type ships in the Turanian system. Yeah. And that ship way back there at our rear. It's probably coming to rescue. Maybe. That ship is on our vector, not the meteors. Well, anyway, it's no problem of ours, is it, sir? I mean, uh, even if we were perfectly safe, this isn't our solar system. No. No, it isn't. That ship on the meteor, I don't know why, but I'd swear it isn't a Turanian ship. Well, after all, if we tried to help, we'd probably be captured. And our first duty is to alert the United Planets about the attack. Isn't that right, sir? Sure. Sure, have that time. Well, even if it only took a few minutes, it's still too big a risk. Poor fellow. All alone in a meteor and in a strange solar system. You know he's all alone. In fact, how do you know anyone's alive after that crash? Obviously, it's an automatic signal. Yeah, yeah that's right. Somehow I get the impression that... Well, we're pretty near up to star drive velocity, aren't we, Commander? Get two spacesuits out of the locker, Happy. Two spacesuits? We'll need them when we land on that meteor on the double hand. Yes, sir, Commander. After rapidly decelerating, Buzz changes vector and heads for the meteor. A few moments later, the star drive ship lands on a barren lump of rock near a damaged spaceship of strange design. In their spacesuits, Buzz and Happy are approaching the wreck. There's no sign of life, sir. Uh, oh. It's funny about that signal. Cut out just as we changed vector and headed for the media. The ship's pretty badly damaged, Commander. There's a big hole in the hull. If anyone's in there, they'd better be wearing a spacesuit. Yeah. I don't see that other ship. Say, maybe they lost us when we changed vector. I hope so. All right, Hap, let's see if we can get the hatch open. Yes, sir. I hope it doesn't lock from inside. Commander, look. Lying there on the deck. Ma'am, the space suit. I think we're too late. He looks awfully pale. No, we can't do anything for him here. We'll carry him to our ship. 
Gently, Buzz and Happy lift the limp figure in the spacesuit and carry him to the control compartment of their own ship. Opening the face pieces of their own helmets, they examine the spacesuit of the stranger for a similar release catch. Hey, the spacesuit is certainly different from ours. How do we get his helmet open? I'll work on it, Happy. You check the viewscope. See if that other ship is in sight. Yes, sir. Did you get a look at the controls of that other fellow's ship? He sure isn't from Tirana. No, and he sure picked a bad part of the galaxy to get wrecked in. Yeah, I'm getting it, Happy. I hope he breathes the same kind of air we do. If he doesn't, he's no worse off than he was in his own ship. Commander, we're in a spot. There's a ship heading straight for this meteor. Just a periscope, half focus it inside that ship. Hurry. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got the helmet open. He's alive. His eyes are open. Thank you. Thank you. Smoking rockets, he speaks English. He's in pretty bad shape. I take care of him. You stand by to blast off and to fire space torpedoes at that ship. Yes, sir. Please, listen to me. I'm hurt. There, there's a medicine kit in the ship. I must have it. Oh, I'm finished. Commander, I've got the periscope focused inside that ship. And guess who's at the control? Smead? Right. And General Mogan. <sighs> medicine. In my ship. Get it, please. Hey, Commander. Smead isn't close enough to use his no ray on us. If we blast off now, we can keep the meteor between us and that ship until we get up velocity again. Oh, no ray. If Smead turns that on us, we're helpless. He's nearly within range, sir. Shall I blast off? Please. Nearly done for. Smead's reaching for the null ray control, sir. What are we going to do? I'm going to save this man's life. Get the medicine kit. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. It's first and ten and go to go. And man, oh man, you don't miss a play when you're peering through the secret eye of your swell Space Patrol periscope. Yes, sir, gang, a periscope comes in mighty handy when you watch a football game or parade. You can use it to see over the heads of the crowds like I'm doing right now. It's a big, big 24 inches high, tapered special for wide-angle vision. A mirror on top, one on the bottom, too. Use it to spy on your Earth pals. The periscope has magic mirrors that let you see around corners and trees, over fences and bushes, but nobody can see you. And say, you and your gang will have a neat time putting your periscopes together. The Space Patrol periscope comes in an official Space Patrol envelope. Just follow directions, they're printed right on the envelope. And in minutes, you're set to start peering through your periscope. So gang, send for yours today. This is the last time we can offer it. The terrific Space Patrol periscope. Just send the rice checks or wheat checks box top. Together with your name and address and 25 cents in coin to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. Now, don't forget your 25 cents and your rice checks or wheat checks box top. And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, Invasion from Tirana. Although they knew a Tyranian patrol ship was after them, Buzz and Happy landed on a small meteor, answering a distress call from the strange spaceship that had crashed. They removed the man in the spacesuit from the wreck, bringing him to their own ship. To their surprise, the rescued man speaks English. Seriously injured, he begged them to bring a medicine kit from his ship. But unless Buzz and Abby blast off quickly, they'll soon be within range of the null ray of a Tyranian patrol ship now rushing toward the meteor. In the patrol ship, the spy Matthew Smead grins triumphantly as the meteor grows larger in the viewscope screen and the images of the two ships are outlined against the dark, jagged rock. We've got Corey this time, General Mognier. He's within the range of the null ray, and he's helpless. Why did he land on that meteor in the first place? He would have escaped into star drive in another few minutes. Obviously, he was investigating that other ship. But that other ship isn't one of the United Planets' ships. And it isn't one of ours. If that isn't one of our ships on the meteor, where is that from? I was just examining it, this morning. And I do believe we're doubly in luck. That wrecked ship is from Varka. Varka? Our next target for Congress. Are you sure? I'm not possible. I haven't briefed myself yet on the characteristics of Varka's ship. It the general description. But I thought the ships from Barco stayed close to their home planet. Perhaps it's a spy ship. If so, it has met with a fate it deserves. However, this will give us a chance to study Barco's equipment. Yes, Kasarik, we've netted a double prize this trip. 
ตัวนี้ได้ชิบกันบ้าง
get some shielding between us and that. I, I, it's no use, Commander. I, I can't move. I, <sighs> Under the effects of the mysterious ray, numbness creeps over the two space patrollers in Omra. Then, complete oblivion. The next thing Buzz and Appy are aware of is a rotating, rushing sound and a painful throbbing in their heads. All is blackness, except for a few pinpoints of light. The points become blurs, and then suddenly come into focus. Happy turns and finds Buzz lying beside him. Commander, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We're in a ship, and we're spaceborne. Yes. It's our own star drive ship. We're alone in the control compartment. Oh, I never expected to wake up alive after that ray. I wonder how we got here. Maybe Omra had something to do with it. Well, how could he get us away from Smeed and General Mogan? Let's get to the controls and check our position. Oh, my head. Stay right where you are, both of you. Smeed. Kasuri, if you please. And you remember General Mogan here? Yes, yes, I remember. And it's no pleasure. It will be even less pleasure before long, Cadet. You were right, Commander, about Parkall. Well, Omra, they took you along, too, I see. Yes, Corey. I want to thank you for saving Omra's life. His knowledge will be of great use to us when we attack this planet. Why have you got us in our ship? Well, it may be of use to us later. Uh, look out the side ports. Wow, a whole fleet of ships. Yes. You are now a part of the Tyrannian Task Force. In a moment, the entire fleet will go into star drive simultaneously and emerge near the United Planet. Yeah, then we must have been unconscious for several hours. Yes, Cadet. You have awakened just in time to watch the destruction of your space patrol defenses. Taran, isn't it? That you should actually help Taran conquer your united plan. I am very sorry. Save your sympathy for yourself, Omra. Perhaps after you see what we do to the united planets, you will persuade the people of Arco to surrender at once. What do you gain by this violence and conquest? You don't need these other planets for survival? The Tyrannians have a greater destiny we must fulfill. We will not rest until we rule the entire galaxy. And obviously we are fitted for this role. Or we would not succeed as we have. Well, there's the warning signal. The entire fleet is going into star drive. Get to the control, Kasuri. Yes, General. Now, Corey, you and the cadet are about to have a dramatic experience. In a few moments, you will see your entire united planet in their last hour of freedom. And then our attack will be hidden. Put in the star drive. Yes, General. What's the matter, Kasori? Go into star drive, I say. Something is wrong. This is Corey's ship. Make him fix it. Come on, Corey. Fix the star drive. We got to keep up with the rest of the task force. Me, this is your operation. You fix it. Don't argue, Corey. Repair that star drive. The general of the intelligence section, I've got to be with the rest of the fleet. If you will look through the viewports, General, you will notice that you are with the fleet. Hey, what's wrong? The ships are still there. They're still in the rocket drive. Yes, General. At this rate, you should arrive at Commander Corey's solar system in about three centuries. Three centuries? Omra, what are you talking about? Look through the nose port, high above your fleet. Why, no, and rockets. Look at that ship. What a monster. It's not a Tyrannian ship. Where did it come from? It is a ship from Barkal. From Barkal? Then your message got through. Yes, Commander. That ship is sending out radiations that cut off every star drive in the Tyrannian fleet. That's easily fixed. Head on the space phone, Kusorek. I ordered the fleet to blast that Barkal ship to pieces. Every weapon you have is useless, General. There will be no attack. You might as well order your fleet to return to their Tyrannian bases. Your leg, General. That's fine. The three are still our captains. And you'll pay for wrecking our plans. Kasorik, destroy that hat. Get speed. Yes, sir. Never mind, Omra. We can handle it. All right, Smeed. Mogna. Get your hands up. I don't know what these weapons of yours will do, but if you want me to find out, just start something. General, don't move. Please. Don't worry, Smeed. He won't move. The commander knocked him cold. Commander, your planets are safe from attack by Tirana from now on. That Barkhall ship will destroy every star drive in the fleet. No Tirana ship can ever invade another solar system again. Hey, that's wonderful, Omra. Hey, but wait. How are we going to get back to Terra? The Barkhall ship won't completely destroy the star drive units until I give the word. After you return home. Will you take me to that big ship, please? Of course. What about Mugnir and Sneed? 
I'll take care of them if you like. I'll return them to their home planet. They will never bother you nor anyone else again. Are you going to punish them? Punish them? Punish? That is a word that has no meaning in the Barkhall language. Oh. Well, let's see. It means... Uh, it doesn't matter. I... Oma has completely stopped all Turanian conquests. But I couldn't have done it if you hadn't sacrificed your own safety to help me. I hope your people and Bayan will always be friends. I'm sure we will be, Oma. Sure, Oma. And I, I think I can explain punishment. Uh, it's what you're doing to Smeed and General Mognier. I still don't understand. You're fixing them so they'll never see anyone but their own kind. That's real punishment. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Hey, Hap, what's all the commotion around the Space Patrol bulletin board? It's a crowd that I couldn't get up close enough to see. I don't know, Captain. Hey, let's peer through our periscopes. Yeah, right over the heads of the crowd. Good idea. Okay, now, what does it say? Smoke and rockets. The message reads, last call for the Space Patrol periscope. Hey, that's right, too. Space Patrollers, this is the last time we can tell you about it. Go ahead, Captain. Tell them. A pleasure, Cadet. Gang, this is an honest-to-goodness periscope with magic mirrors. One on top, one on the bottom. Through them, you see around corners and over fences, around trees and over bushes, but nobody can see you. Yes, you see without being seen. And it's big, 24 inches high. Tapered special for wide-angle vision. There's a special identification chart printed right on it. Pictures of the citizens of all the major planets. Jumpin' Jupiter, you can have lots of fun playing secret space agent or Earth spy with a space patrol periscope. But remember, this is the last time that we can make this terrific offer. So space patrollers right away today send our rice checks or wheat checks box top. Together with your name and address and 25 cents in coin to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686. St. Louis, Missouri. Don't forget your 25 cents and a rice checks or wheat checks box top. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Bite-sized checks taste good to me. Bite-sized checks, wheat checks, rice checks. Take your checkerboard cereal today. And now, a preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy have just rescued two men from a damaged space freighter. Right now, in their spacesuits, they're helping the two men through the airlock into their patrol ship. Close the hatch, Hap. Yes, sir. Raise our face pieces now. The cadet will take you back aft, man. Thanks. Perhaps I let the fellows in. You'd better hold them. Right, Commander. I've got something in this box that'll make them feel better. Oh, a uh, first aid kit, huh? Not quite. If you don't get your hands up, you'll need more than a first aid kit. Commander, it's a blast gun. They're taking over the ship, Corey. Do as you're told and you'll stay alive. Be sure to be with us next week for the thrilling story, The Voice from the Future, when Nestle's Chocolate presents Space Patrol. <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kimmerer Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Helen Moser. <laughs> Other players were Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufeld speaking. <laughs> this program is broadcast for our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. <laughs>